And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. I'd ask uh, Mr. Thornton, did you give the instructions earlier to everybody about uh, testifying virtually? All the technical instructions? I assume you did. All right. Without objection, members of the full committee, not on this subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. With the hybrid format of this hearing, we have some members and witnesses participating in person and others on the WebEx platform. I'd like to remind all members participating remotely to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. The staff has been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there's inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time, and I'm aware that there are several hearings going on uh, even as we speak, but you can only participate in one at a time. If you are participating remotely today, please keep your camera on, and if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn it off. This hearing is entitled The Future of Banking, How Consolidation, Non-Bank Competition, and Technology Are Reshaping the Banking System. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Following the financial crisis, uh, former Federal Reserve Chair Paul Volcker was once asked about financial innovation and regulatory reform, and he said, quote, the most important financial innovation that I've seen in the past 20 years is the automatic teller machine, the ATM. It really helps people, prevents visits to the bank, and it is a real convenience. How many other innovations can you tell me of that that have been as important to the individual as the ATM, which is more of a mechanical innovation than a financial one, unquote. I don't bring this up to say financial innovation is bad and bank technology needs to stop at ATMs, but there is a point to what Mr. Volcker said. From the consumer perspective, the ATM is widely, wildly useful product and it's not such a complicated idea. However, many so-called innovative and complex financial products like credit default swaps or balloon mortgage payments got us into a lot of trouble back in 2008. But in the dozen years since the financial crisis, there have been many real innovations in banking with clear benefits to consumers. You can access your accounts and transfer funds with your smartphone. Credit unions and banks have developed advanced fraud detection to address the rise in cybersecurity threats. I recently was notified that there had been uh, some fraudulent activity on one of my accounts that was actually noticed within hours of the, uh, of the activity. New tools and analytics help consumers set and track savings and spending goals. We are also seeing more financial institutions use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and algorithmic-based decisions. These technologies offer a great deal of promise, but also raise new consumer protection issues. Another trend over the past decades has been the consolidation in the banking sector. In 1984, there were 18,000 different banks across the country. Today, there are less than 5,000, and the number of new bank charters has fallen to a record low. The number of credit unions has also fallen from about 15,000 in 2004 to about 5,000 today. With fewer banks and credit unions, there is less consumer choice when it comes to depository institutions. But this is not to say traditional financial institutions are completely without new competition. Financial technology companies often referred to as fintech, have captured a larger and larger share of consumer, mortgage, and small business lending markets. These firms are often not subject to the same regulations banks and credit unions are, but often compete in the same markets. In April, this subcommittee held a hearing on the trends of financial institution charters. We look back in history at the powers of the National Bank Act the original purpose of industrial loan companies and examining how banking laws are being used, and in some cases stretched to fit an evolving financial services sector. As illustrated by that hearing, there are significant challenges for Congress and regulators to keep up with modern day trends. My time has expired, so I will now yield to Mr. Luke DeMeyer, ranking member of this committee for four minutes? Five minutes. Uh, thank However you. long he wants to take, up to five <laughs> minutes. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think we're scheduled for four, and then my ranker was going to take one, but he's unable to be here today. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert his statement into the uh, record for him. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for having this important uh, hearing today. Uh, and, uh, and our witnesses also for uh, testifying before us. We look forward to your uh, insightful information that you're going to work with us on today. This hearing asks us to consider the future of banking, a very broad subject. In order to understand where banking is going, we need to examine what has happened to banking in the past. <clears throat> At the turn of the century, there were 9,600 FDIC insured banks. Today, there are a little more than 4,900. Potentially more troubling, the number of banks with less than 100 million in assets has declined by 92% since 1985. What are the leading factors driving consolidation in the banking sector? What are the practical impacts on consumers? And what are common sense private sector solutions to this problem? These are the questions we should be examining at this hearing today. Significant consolidation in the banking sector has been occurring for the past three decades. However, there is no doubt the impacts of the post dodd frank regulatory regime are hurting small financial institutions. A 2020 FDIC study examined the per unit costs associated with operating a community bank below 10 billion in assets. They found that in the year 2000, the most efficient size for a community bank was 350 million. In 2019, the most efficient size of a bank was 3.2 billion. In short, the FDIC study found that the current regulatory landscape has created an ecosystem where size equals survival. While community banks continue to consolidate, non-bank firms, including fintechs, have risen sharply in their absence. It is clear that fintechs have spurred innovation in the financial services sector and increased access to credit for consumers. Much of this innovation and inclusion has come through bank fintech partnerships. These relationships allow fintechs to innovate all the while being regulated by bank regulators through their examination and supervision of a bank's third party risk unit. All of this information. Uh, gentlemen, we'll yield for a second. Uh, let's get that fixed, whatever that was. Thornton. Okay. <clears throat> See. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All this information begs the question what should Congress do? To start, we should examine what specifically is driving up the costs for community financial institutions and look at ways of alleviating those costs through regulatory reform. Second, we should examine the processes and requirements in place for de novo institutions. We saw the formation of 15 de novo institutions in 2020, a far cry from the 149 a year before we saw Dodd-Frank. Third, we should ensure a bank fintech partnership model remains intact. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have dismantled a bank fintech bank fintech ecosystem by reversing the OCC's true lender rule. While Republicans are looking to add solutions uh, that allow the private sector to innovate in a manner that solve these problems, improve inclusion, and decrease banking deserts, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have a very different view of the future of banking. In just this Congress, we have seen the majority put forward proposals to turn the CFPB into a public credit bureau, establish postal banking, and establish government control of the banking system through Fed accounts. In fact, the recent Biden nomination for Comptroller argued for Fed accounts, even though in her own words, it would, I quote, end banking as we know it, end quote. A government takeover of the banking system is truly one of the most radical ideas I've heard in my time in Congress, and yet it has become a mainstream tenet of the majority's platform. It truly terrifies me that these ideas are receiving serious consideration in this committee. At a time when the leaders of the House and Senate are desperately pursuing Bernie Sanders' social yes. agenda, and the president appointed an OCC chair with hopes of ending banking, the future of banking couldn't be in more limbo. I thank the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to discussing how Congress can and should allow the private sector to improve the banking system. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And seeing that the chair of the full committee isn't here, I'll take that last 49 seconds that I had left for her to just say, given the challenges of keeping up with the present, I'm excited for today's hearing entitled The Future of Banking, How Consolidation, Non-Bank Competition, and Technology Are Reshaping the Banking System. Today's hearing is about ensuring 10 or 20 years down the road, we have a banking system that is innovative, consumer-driven, and competitive, and making sure it works for every American. So now, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. I thank you all for appearing uh, virtually. Um, first, I'd like to begin with Paulina Gonzalez-Brito. 
is the executive director of the California Reinvestment Coalition. Coalition. Paulina has more than 20 years of experience working on economic justice and community empowerment issues and currently serves on the board of directors for the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. Second witness is Dr. Makeda Henry Nicky, who is the Robert, Robert and Virginia Hartley Fellow of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. Makeda is an expert in FinTech issues and equitable access to financial services and formerly worked as a senior analyst with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Sarah Jane Hughes is the University Scholar and Fellow in Commercial Law at Indiana University School of Law. She is an expert on payment systems, online banking, and privacy issues. Desiree Jackson is the Assistant Vice President for Treasury Management at Beneficial State Bank. She is a member of the Communication Workers of America, Local 9412, and has worked in the financial services sector for more than 25 years. Jim Reuter is a friend of mine, is the Chief Executive of First Bank uh, in Colorado, headquartered in Colorado, testifying on behalf of the American Bankers Association. Jim started his career at First Bank in 1987 and has worked in various departments within the bank, including mortgage operations, IT, online banking, payments, contact center, and treasury management. He is the former chair of the American Bankers Council. Witnesses, you are reminded your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer at the bottom of your screen, and that will indicate how much time you have left. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. I would ask you all to be mindful of the timer, and when the red light appears, to wrap up your testimony so, so we can be respectful of both the other witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. So let's start with Paulina Gonzalez Brito. You are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to join you today, Chair Perlmutter and Ranking Member Lutemeyer. My name is Paulina Gonzalez Brito, and I go by the pronouns they, them. I am Purepecha, Chicane, and my people come from the original people of Michoacan and Zacatecas. I am the Executive Director of the California Reinvestment Coalition, or CRC, and we work, to, we work to close the racial wealth gap. From the stealing of land to the enslavement of Black people, through housing, lending, and financial policies, the U.S. has always profited from the labor of Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC, while simultaneously denying us wealth. As we continue to march down the path of mergers and acquisitions, resulting in fewer financial institutions, the closure of branches, branches and less reinvestment, it is no surprise to anyone that communities of color are disproportionately impacted. With the support of Chair Waters, President Biden recently issued an executive order meant to improve regulatory oversight of bank mergers. It is imperative that regulators not rubber stamp merger applications, but give proposed mergers the scrutiny they deserve. This year alone in California, CRC and our members have negotiated three community benefits agreements to ensure that proposed bank mergers have a public benefit. The agreements with banks articulate community needs and how the bank will meet that need and therefore furthers CRA implementation. Just last week, U.S. Bank announced plans to acquire Union Bank. Currently, neither bank has community benefits agreements. In addition to looking at whether a merger will create a public benefit, regulators must also evaluate the possibility of public harm. In the case of U.S. Bank's proposed merger with Union, U.S. Bank plans to make cuts. These planned cuts are made possible by branch overlap in four big California counties, LA, Orange, San Diego, and Santa Clara, where more than 50% of unions branches are located. It is our position that there should be no branch closures as a result of this merger. As we experience branch closures, we are told to embrace FinTech. In our society, we like to think of technology as the great equalizer. This is certainly not the case. In fact, technology benefits financial institutions by lowering overhead costs, but the benefits to BIPOC communities are less clear. Case in point, the Federal Reserve of Kansas found that there are two reasons for the lack of adoption of financial services, financial exclusion and digital exclusion. These findings are consistent with what we see in CRC's Economic Wellness Promotora Program, which supports the financial well-being of low-income BIPOC families. Black and Latina participants reported experiencing poor and or unfriendly service from banks. 
participants express being made to feel not good enough or wrong or unwelcome when attempting to access banking products and services. The encroachment of fintech into banking brings concerns of hypercharged harm. Venmo, PayPal, Square, SoFi, Google, Apple, and the growing number of tech financial services companies use complicated and rapidly changing algorithms that process mass, mass amounts of data to make credit decisions. If technology advances faster than our understanding of it, regulation becomes very difficult, if not impossible, and the threat of resulting discrimination is get greater. In pursuit of profits, financial institutions will take as many liberties as they are given. Let's take Amazon as an example. Amazon has long been in the fintech space and has done so without becoming a bank and without banking regulator oversight or CRA obligations. Amazon Lending invites its sellers to apply for their loans and has effectively created a 21st century uh, company store. Amazon loans can only be used for inventory or marketing on the e-commerce site. And if a merchant cannot make a payment, Amazon can seize the merchant's inventory and collateral to pay back the loan. Our communities lack access to safe, affordable credit banking services. There's another solution to be considered. We must nurture public banking, either through the creation of local public banks that are tied to the Federal Reserve or the creation of postal banking. Every American has a post office in their community. They should have a bank too. Congress can stop the abuses of the foreseeable future by supporting a strong Community Reinvestment Act that explicitly considers race, enhances the role of community voices and community benefits agreements, downgrades banks for harm, and discourages further branch closures. We also urge all regulators to develop a coordinated and robust regulatory response to FinTech that ensures strong compliance with consumer protection and fair lending laws. Thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Uh, thank you, Director Gonzalez Brito. Our next witness is Dr. Henry Nicky. You are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. I think you're on mute. Thank you for clearing that up. Chairman Perlmutter, Ranking Member Luktemeyer, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm pleased to join today's hearing on the future of banking. I'm Makeda Henry Nicky, Governance Studies Fellow at the Brookings Institution. My comments today will focus on market trends, the rise of fintechs as consequential market players, and the impact of these shifts on marginalized consumers. My comments on these issues are my own and do not reflect any official position from the Brookings Institution. The US is facing a major demographic, demographic transition driven exclusively by communities of color. In the last decade alone, Asian and Hispanic American populations grew by 36 and 23% respectively. But the financial services sector is yet to respond to these representational changes within the consumer financial market. Minority households systematically occupy status quo roles on the fringe, rather than sitting at the center of market models as growth drivers. According to the FDIC's 2019 banking survey, 7.1 million households remain unbanked. The overwhelming majority of these households, 64% to be precise, were Black and Hispanic. Indigenous communities have an unenviable, long-standing experience of exclusion. Despite modest progress in promoting financial inclusion, 16.3% of Indigenous Americans are unbanked and are disproportionately exposed to alternative financial products such as predatorial payday and title loans. The prosperity of the U.S. is stifled when the future growth segments are excluded from fully participating in the economy. The Biden administration has drawn on a comprehensive accountability model to orient the federal government's policy framework towards racial inclusion. Now, while President Biden's racial equity agenda marks a sea change, it's only a first step towards closing profound racial wealth gaps. Financial intermediaries and regulators must do their part to ensure that the financial services ecosystem responds to the unmet needs of minority communities. The Great Recession has dramatically altered, as you noted, the banking landscape. More than a decade after the subprime crisis, the banking infrastructure continues to contract. In the years since the housing bubble, the number of commercial banks has fallen sharply from 7,300 institutions in 2007 to 4,375 in 2020. That's an astonishing 40% decline. This shrinkage is in large part due to consolidation through mergers and acquisitions, with larger banks absorbing small ones. The vast majorities of these mergers and acquisitions unfolded in the community banking sector, which according to the FDIC accounted for 91% of this cons consolidation trend. 
It's important to know that acquired community banks tended to be less profitable than their peers and were often cited as problematic by the FDIC. Another concerning trend is a lack of new bank formation that has shaped the competition dynamics during the same time. A combination of enhanced regulatory oversight and market dynamics undermines bank formation and increases complexities in the post-crisis era. Contrary to broader trends, in uh, select segments within underserved communities, these communities disproportionately rely on physical retail outlets to connect with mainstream banking. This retail uh, network is shrinking, contracting, and under threat with the increase and accelerated pace of mergers and, and acquisitions. The FDIC's 2019 survey underscored the importance of retail outlets to groups that visit branches more than 10 times a year. Those are older Americans, people with disabilities, individuals experiencing regular income volatility, and Native peoples. The hollowing out of the retail bank footprint also impacts the small business community. Studies have shown that bank closures adversely affect small business lending and uh, bank branches that have lenders, excuse me, without bank branches allocate less capital to small businesses than those with, with branches in uh, low income communities. Now, efficiency gains are celebrated, right? That's the, mer the mantra of merging institutions. But low income communities rarely, if ever, realize these economies of scale. Instead, the mergers have resulted in a rise in FHA loan denials, substantial increases in interest rate loans on non agency mortgages, particularly for subprime borrowers. The lack of existing bank relationships is a defining characteristics for uh, Black PPP applicants. Congress has a duty to create a framework to ensure that consumers remain protected during this dynamic innovation process in which fintechs and banks and non-banks are vying to serve and find the right balance of a uh, mix of products to bring to market. Congress can take clear steps to protect consumers and restore their ability to hold innovators and abdicators responsible for their decisions. This subcommittee should examine how to extend the authority of the CFPB to include oversight of the Community Reinvestment Act. Compliance with CRA is a crucial tool that allows regulators to hold lenders accountable while deepening lending in low-income communities. Again, thank you for hosting this critical conversation on the future of banking. Thank you, Dr. Henry Nicky. And now we have Professor Sarah Ann Hughes, or Sarah Jane, pardon me, what is it? Sarah Jane Hughes, pardon me. Professor, uh, you have five minutes. And you are muted. And for me, so I'm going to start my own timer and let it go. So, uh, good morning, Chairman Palmutter, Ranking Member Lookmeyer, Honorable Members of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions of the Committee on Financial Services. It's a great honor to appear for, before you today to discuss topics that are of great consequence, bank consolidation, non-bank competition, and technology, and the manner in which they are reshaping American banking, some, some pieces for the good and other pieces, as other witnesses have mentioned, with less desirable effects in some respects. My prepared statement touches upon um, many of these subjects, including just bank consolidation, challenge the challenges that consolidation poses for small towns and rural communities that are still very important to us including here in south central indiana how non-bank competition is changing banking and the role that technology is playing in driving changes to banking services and availability including for the partnerships that um, the chairman mentioned in his opening statement so uh, in in the interest of time I think it is important to realize that we are not in a, we're in a perhaps more robust phase of non-bank competitors, but we've basically been in this space with non-bank competitors taking over pieces of bank action for approximately 40 years, if not longer, because the credit card industry might be claimed to do that as well. So it's not like it's new, it's just that it's a little more robust and it is based on, um, the internet and other forms of online services that are available. So some non-bank competitors have been around for 100 years and 
it, they were beginning to be very robust in the late 50s and early 60s, but not at the level we see today. The um, I'd like to speak in about industrial loan companies for a moment because industrial loan companies have been around for quite a long time since Congress authorized them. The states and the FDIC are the regulators for industrial loan companies. They are subject to thorough investigation before they obtain their state charters and before they obtain FDIC um, deposit insurance. I have no reason to believe that it is less robust than what happens with other state banks that the FDIC is reviewing. And as one of the witnesses mentioned, there have been a few, not very many, de novo banks, which we think of as rising to take the place often of what happens after banks consolidate. ILCs are not in that space. ILCs have, the states have expanded the powers of ILCs and industrial banks since the late 1980s so that their powers now are very close to, if not identical to, the lending powers that other state banks have and the FDIC ensures the, the non-retail deposits that are there. But it is the thorough supervision and examination by both the FDIC and the states that, that is very successful and has resulted in very few complaints of which I am aware. And I, at least once a quarter, I review the complaint um, database for the CFPB just to be sure that I'm still keeping current with that. It's very hard to estimate how many fintechs are out there. We know that the American Fintech Council earlier this year revealed that it had 75 members. And they have, as I described in my uh, prepared statement, some specific sorts of responsibility. The fintechs also hold state licenses, either as lenders or as money transmitters. And like industrial loan companies, they are subject to examination and supervision by the states. They don't have FDIC insurance at this point, so we don't have the FDIC behind them. But because they have this same state, boots on the ground, close to consumers, um, orientation in many cases with state regulators being in charge, they are um, they are not unregulated. And I think it is very important to realize that they are not unregulated, just as ILCs and state chartered banks are not unregulated. The Bank Service Corporation piece of my prepared statement is important because I am aware of the fact that Bank Service Corporation um, authority is pending in Congress. And with that, I'd like to close my remarks, tell you that I'm a big fan of state chartered banks. I appreciate, the, and, and I'm a, a big fan of the state regulation of non-bank providers. I think they do a pretty good job. So I'd like to close my remarks and thank you for including me. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, next witness is Ms. Desiree Jackson. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Subcommittee Chairman Paul Mutter and the members of the committee. My name is Desiree Jackson. I am an Assistant Vice President for Treasury Management Services at Beneficial State Bank in Oakland, California. And I'm also a proud member of the Communications Workers of America Local 9412. Last year, my coworkers and I made history when we became the first group of bank workers to organize a union in over 40 years. And this past Sunday, we ratified our first union contract. I have worked in the banking industry for over 25 years, including 18 years at Wells Fargo. So I'm excited to share my perspective on the future of our banking system. Frontline bank jobs are stressful. We are under extreme time pressures, and we know that mistakes can harm our customers. Whether or not a bank respects its workers' rights greatly impacts our stress levels. It is also a good predictor of whether a merger will impact us and our customers positively or negatively. During my time at Wells Fargo, I worked in a call center as a customer service representative where I was responsible for opening accounts after they were sold. When Wells Fargo bought other banks like Norwest Bank and Wachovia Bank, it made our workload more intense. We had to do more with less. 
our performance metrics got more excessive, meaning we had to complete all of our assigned work each day or we would get a talking to by our manager. We had to answer our phone by the second ring, emails had to be responded to within two hours, and we had strict deadlines for opening customer accounts. But there was no opportunity to even get raises through expectations, even though our jobs had increased. Managers pressured us to work as many hours as necessary to complete our daily assigned tasks, like making sure every account was open. But they didn't care how many hours we worked because the bank misclassified us as salaried employees, so they didn't have to pay us overtime. On top of that, departments closed, people were laid off, instilling even more stress and fear. Basically, Wells Fargo used mergers to cut staff even if it meant getting rid of experienced staff who were skilled at the serving at the best interests of our customers. This management style is all too common in the industry. It means that bank workers often experience huge stress and there are sometimes incentives for workers to take actions that harm consumers. That's why I strongly support the Financial Services Worker Bill of Rights. Luckily, my experience at Beneficial State Bank couldn't be more different. Beneficial is a mission-driven bank owned by a nonprofit foundation and is committed to serving communities that need access to financial services. When Beneficial has acquired small banks over the last few years, they have been like-minded community banks, enabling us to serve more communities in need. No one lost their job, and there was an open communication process which with much better transparency. We held monthly bank-wide meetings to explain what was going on. And now with our union contract, we will have regular labor management meetings where we can discuss a range of issues, including how we can improve customer service. The reality is there has been too much consolidation in the industry. And I wanna make sure that small mission-oriented banks like Beneficial can thrive and not be swallowed up by predatory mega banks. That's why I think Congress should strengthen the merger standards to ensure that mergers are in public interest and improve wages and working conditions. Meanwhile, online banking is creating more cashless banks and reducing the number of brick and mortar branches, threatening the livelihood of 423,000 bank tellers in the country and possibly reducing access to banking for the underserved consumer who can't utilize the newer technology. For my 25 years of experience in banking, I think there is room to ensure that employees are taken care of when there are mergers, and that is through unionizing, making sure frontline bank workers' rights are protected by empowering more of us to organize will not only reduce our unhealthy stress levels, but it will be better for our customers, better for our communities, and better for our entire financial system. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Jackson. Now our final witness is Mr. Jim Reuter. You are now recognized for five minutes uh, for your testimony, sir. Chairman Perlmutter and Ranking Member Luke DeMeyer and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the future of banking. As a banker for over 34 years, this hearing could not be more timely given the changes underway in our industry. I am pleased today to speak not only on the behalf of First Bank and our 3,000 employees, but also on behalf of the American Bankers Association, which represents banks of all sizes, and the 2 million women and men who work at those banks and serve your constituents every day. Founded in 1963, First Bank has grown organically to more than 100 locations in Colorado and Arizona, we are currently the largest bank headquartered in Colorado. Despite our footprint, we were one of the first banks to join real-time payments networks and offer Zelle payment services to customers. While our business is banking, our commitment to the communities we serve goes well beyond that. Our 300 bank officers sit on two to three nonprofit boards each, and our most recent Colorado Gives Day raised over $50 million for more than 2,000 nonprofits in 24 hours. Before we look to the future, I'd like to reflect for a moment on where banking stands today. As federal regulators have noted, banks have been a source of strength during the pandemic, providing critical financial support for the economy while maintaining record levels of capital and deposits. 
At First Bank, we were the number one bank in Colorado for PPP loans, originating more than 20,000 that helped save over 120,000 jobs in the state. We also realize that the ongoing pandemic is not over and many Americans are still struggling. Like many banks around the country, we continue to prioritize financial inclusion. ABA has sounded the alarm on this issue and urged banks of all sizes to offer safe, low-fee, bank-on certified accounts, which are helping reduce the number of unbanked. Today, bank-on accounts are offered in more than half the bank branches in this country. Our industry is optimistic about the future, but like all businesses, we face challenges. You encouraged us to focus on how consolidation, non-bank competition, and technology are reshaping the banking system. Bank consolidation is a long-term trend. Today, there are just under 5,000 banks in the U.S., down from nearly 18,000 in 1984, and we expect consolidation to continue for a variety of reasons. The need for scale is the main driver. Banks at every level of the asset ladder are seeking scale to invest in the ongoing digital transformation reshaping our industry. At First Bank, our strategy has been to focus on organic growth without significant M&A, but other banks are taking different approaches. Bank consolidation has likely been accelerated by policy decisions, including a regulatory framework that imposes significant compliance costs and deters de novo bank creation. One troubling new trend we urge this committee to review, tax-exempt credit unions are increasingly using their tax subsidy to buy up tax-paying banks. From 2018 to 2020, more than 28 banks were acquired by credit unions. Despite consolidation, banking remains a healthy, diverse, and highly competitive industry. As the banking industry consolidates, many of our biggest competitors have emerged outside the regulated banking space. The list includes tax-advantaged lenders like credit unions and the farm credit system, monoline fintech firms, non-bank payment providers, and decentralized finance technologies like cryptocurrency. Many of those competitors have business models that rely on a kind of regulatory arbitrage in which they can offer one or several aspects of banking services while avoiding the full banking regulatory framework. We see this most clearly in the rise of payments charters or special purpose national bank charters that would aim to provide payment system access to companies but would not be subject to the same regulations as banks. In our view, the stringent rules in place for banks should be applied to others looking to offer bank-like services. Anything less than a level playing field will put consumers and financial systems at risk. The pandemic has only accelerated banking's digital transformation. At First Bank, we have more than 400 people in our information technology unit, up from 250 five years ago. ABA firmly believes that banks and the private sector will continue to drive this technological revolution. The one innovation we don't need is the government trying to replace the nation's banks. We will continue to firmly oppose efforts to create direct consumer accounts at the Federal Reserve, turn the Postal Service into a consumer bank, or create a central bank digital currency that disintermediates banks. These are solutions in search of a problem that if implemented would drain deposits out of banks and undermine the value banks to deliver consumers uh, convenient funds, access, and loans to support a local, local economic growth. Ultimately, these approaches would put at risk the many benefits of the modern banking system. Despite challenges, we believe the future of banking is bright, provided the policy environment continues to support growth and closes gaps that promote regulatory arbitrage and put the financial system and consumers at risk. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reuter. Thank you for your testimony. Now I will recognize myself for five minutes uh, for questions. And first thing is, I'll just say, being one of the older members of this committee, uh, much of the consolidation, much of the reduction in the number of banks occurred in the late 80s and 90s when the savings and loan system failed and uh, many small and medium-sized banks across the country either went out of business or were acquired by others. But there has been a continued uh, reduction and consolidation of the industry. So, Mr. Reuter, one of the principal reasons you cite is the need for financial institutions to scale up in order to invest in technology. As more banks and credit unions to can continue to scale up, either through mergers and acquisitions or, or organic growth, do you see the bar to entry becoming even greater for de novo banks? Thank you for that question, Chairman. Um, I do see the bar for entry for de novo charter to be higher. 
Um, one of the reasons is the regulatory burden. Um, it, you know, we have a number of regulations that haven't been reviewed for decades, and some of them have not kept up with the changing times. The other one is that investment in technology. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier we went from 250 employees in technology up to over 500 in five years. Our annual spend has gone from $50 million a year to over $110 million a year. Uh, ranking member Luke DeMeyer pointed out uh, a study that in 2000, $350 million was the asset size to be efficient, and today that's climbed to $3.2 billion. So when you think about someone starting a single bank location or two bank location de novo charter, uh, those barriers to entry are significant. Well, let me follow up then. So, you know, you said that we expect this consolidation to continue, and uh, the ability to get a de novo charter seems to be pretty difficult. Uh, should we be concerned that we may be only, we may be left with only a handful of banks and fintech companies in 10 or 20 years? I think the banking industry, you know, at, at uh, nearly 5,000 is still very competitive, Chair, Chairman. And um, while I think there'll be continued consolidation, I think there is a place for community banks. Clearly, we're one of those community banks, and you saw what we did with PPP. So while I believe there'll be continued consolidation to find efficiencies given the regulatory requirements as well as the lift in technology, I think they'll continue to be a diverse banking system. But one thing I think is really important is a level playing field from a regulatory perspective with the fintechs. Many of them purposely are picking off parts of our business, avoiding holding deposits and different things so they can avoid the regulatory requirements. I think it's important we have a level playing field or you'll drive even further more bank consolidation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry Nicky, can you talk about the role fintechs play as partners with small and medium-sized financial institutions. And do you think these partnerships help or hurt the smaller banks uh, compete with larger banks? Thank you for your question. I think you point an important uh, externality, uh, potentially upside for community banks that do partner with FinTech institutions. Um, as uh, Mr. Royden pointed out, the hurdles to transforming and modernizing uh, community banks is, is substantial when it comes to transforming legacy infrastructure that you know old cobalt systems into new systems that can you know intersect with mobile banking that you know consumers have grown to expect and demand of their banks so in that regard i think you know these partnerships with fintechs are helping to one reduce the technical barriers and two help really drag along the community uh, banking uh, sector and 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 those benefits uh, accrue to the, co the communities the local communities that these banks tend to serve uh, I, I think you know moving forward we really want to be careful and mindful about how these vendor contracts are uh, you know, structured what are the implications for consumers? Do these banks have full capacity on their staff uh, to, you know, fully vet, to put fully uh, stand up contracts that are beneficial to their longevity, uh, you know, in the system that doesn't sort of set them up for perhaps a, a picking off in the future? Uh, I think, again, going back to, you know, where we started around these mergers and where fintechs are entering into the space, these community arrangements can be helpful, these partnerships, but caution always with a cautionary tag attached. Uh, thank you for your testimony. My time is about to expire, so I'll recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke DeMeyer, for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for being here today. Interesting discussion we're having this morning. Um, <clears throat> you know, let me follow up a little bit on uh, the chairman's question here with regards to uh, banks and fintechs. Uh, as a ranker on small business, uh, we saw uh, the banks being very, very effective with uh, PPP loans, and the, any problems with regards to fraud or misuse of funds seems to be pretty well located in the fintech part of this. So, Mr. Reuter, um, let me just ask you this question. Um, what about what about <clears throat> rules and regulations for fintech folks? I'm not against innovation. I think it's important. We've got to continue to do it, but at some point, uh, this, the PPP program points out the inability to control the fintechs and some of the things they're doing and shows the amount of fraud that could be perpetrated in that area. And so what do you think about the rules and regulations around those guys? 
Well, Ranking Member Luke DeMeyer, thank you for that question. Um, I think the rules need to be much like a bank because their activities are very bank-like. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we were the number one bank in Colorado with PPP loans. We're on the phone with those customers. Uh, we're forging relationships. It's not just a transaction for us. Uh, many of the online lenders, you fill everything out, out online and you get a decision within minutes. So you tell me how well they're vetting the business, how well they're understanding what the needs are of that business and taking a relationship approach. To me, that's a fundamental difference between banks and fintech providers, and uh, I do think there needs to be more regulation in that space. Thank you. Uh, this week on Monday in the Washington Times, there's an article uh, titled The Death of Financial Privacy. Now, the other party is uh, wanting to weaponize the financial services system and the IRS to, to monitor all the transactions of every bank account over $600. This is going to cause a tremendous amount of cost on all of the banks. Uh, so, Mr. Reuter, are you set up right now to be able to handle that situation to where you can forward on to the IRS every transaction on every person in every business in your, your bank over $600? We are not set up to be able to do that. Do you have an idea what that would cost your bank to be able to do that? It would be significant, and I think the bigger issue as well as the concerns our customers would have over privacy. Uh, many people uh, in the unbanked uh, have chosen not to bank with banks because of trust, and I think reporting all the information to the government would not help us in that regard. Yeah, you know, it, even the big banks, it's going to be a significant cost, but the community banks would seem to me you're just going to actually run them out of business with, some, with, with, a, with an issue like this. Um, uh, Professor Hughes, um, you talked a little bit about some of the uh, rules, regulations, and size. To me, I want to run something by you real quickly. Um, it would seem to me that if you're going to try and regulate the local hardware store, you're going to re re regulate Walmart, there have, almost have to be two different sets of rules for those folks because you couldn't more regulate the local folks the same as you re was re regulate Walmart. Uh, to take that analogy and put it into banking, you, a community bank, Hundred two hundred million dollars versus J.P. Morgan. How can you use those same rules and regulations and apply it to the banks? To me, this is one of our problems, and causing banks to really have to comply with all these rules. The cost is just running away, just like this new rule that's being proposed uh, would cause them probably to be unable to to do that. So, do you agree that perhaps we need to size all our regulations based on? The, the size of the banks. In other words, small community banks would have one set of rules that they'd have to abide by, but not necessarily every single rule that the big banks would have to abide by. Is that a, is that a reasonable expectation? Well, uh, I, yeah. yeah, here I am. I, I think this is a very complicated question because we don't want to make <laughs> community banks, and I've said in my prepared statement, I'm a huge fan of community banks. Um, I, they serve the community I live in and those around us very, very capably. I don't think we want to make them um, targets for bad behavior by customers. So I think the scaling of it would have to be done with great care. I do think that there are rules that are being applied to community banks that make it harder for them to survive because of costs. And to that extent, um, I heard Dr. Henry Nicky and and um, and Miss Jackson make some claims that we and um, make claims that we need to be certain that we do not lose banks serving every community in the United States that can reasonably be served. So I'm in favor of looking for opportunities to reduce regulatory burdens on community banks and. Um, community national banks, to the extent that those regulations, they're, they're not participating in some of the same kinds of, of transactions that the giants in this country are participating professor, in. Professor? Yes. Thank you for your thank, comment, Professor. I'm, thank I'm out thank of time. you, Professor. Uh, you gentleman's time has expired. I'd like to now recognize the gentlewoman from California, the chair of the Financial Services Committee, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Perlmutter, uh, for this hearing. This is extraordinarily important. Uh, we have done considerable work 
uh, dealing with our banks, but so much more uh, has to be done. Uh, let me just say that, of course, uh, most of uh, the banks in this country take credit for the work that they did with our PPP loans. But if you can remember, uh, in the beginning of the PPP loans, um, many of the big banks set up special porters uh, for their concierge clients. And we ran out of money for the PPP loans. And we came back and we put in another $60 billion so that our MDIs uh, and our credit unions and our community banks would have an opportunity uh, to participate more fully with PPP. So we thank those for uh, having participated, but still we have to do work uh, with the banks, whether we're talking about PPP loans and the way that uh, they were handled in the beginning uh, with the portals, again, uh, that serve their concierge clients. Uh, but uh, on consolidation, Back in the day, uh, there used to be hearings uh, that were held by the feds where they invited the community in on mergers. And we had an opportunity uh, to get people from our communities who were very much involved uh, with oversight uh, in their own way of uh, these banks. We had an opportunity to weigh in on the mergers. Now our committee, Mr. Perlmutter, must get back with the feds and we must open up this opportunity because this business of, of mergers without real community involvement has got to stop. And so this is an issue that we must deal with. Not only that, you know, I'm concerned that we get many complaints about banks, uh, but people feel helpless uh, to absolutely correct the problems that are created within the banks. And we experience a lot of this and we know uh, that still a lot of work has to be done dealing with the servicing of these mortgages where people uh, find that fraud uh, has been committed and they have nowhere to turn, on and on and on. And so we have to pay more attention to servicing. And uh, I think, I, Mr. Perlmutter, I want us to take a look at advisory committees. Some of the banks say they have advisory committees, but I'm thinking, and we'll, we'll talk about this, whether or not we need to have advisory committees for every uh, bank, and not only you know at the headquarters level, but at all of the community levels uh, for the banks, so that people get more involved. CRA kind of alludes to that in some way, that there should be advisory committees of some kind. And some of them say that they have them, but I don't think that uh, they're real. And so I wanna look at how we can get for these branches in the communities, advisory committees for all of them, so the communities are invited in and they can participate uh, in what is going on at the banks. We know that some banks have improved uh, their pay, their wages, uh, that we have had the banks in and when we brought them in uh, for oversight on our committee, they hadn't been in for 10 years. And they began to do things before they came to the hearing in terms of wages. And as you know, Bank of America, I think is kind of in the leadership now of having increased the, uh, the minimum wages uh, up to about $20 per hour. And so we need to do everything we can to encourage that uh, in every way that we can. Uh, and when the banks, we will continue to bring them uh, before us so that we can have them understand uh, that we are very serious in this committee about doing what we need to do for all of the clients of the bank. Let me just ask Ms. Jackson, do you think that it is wise for us uh, to uh, ensure that the feds have um, these open meetings when mergers are being proposed and whether or not we should have these advisory committees at every branch uh, in all of the banking. What do you think? Thank you, Congressman Waters. I totally agree. I, I think it would be beneficial. I sat on uh, various advisory boards and other, arena, other arenas, and I would definitely, I, I definitely would like to see that happen. Thank you I very think much. we can all benefit from that. And thank you for your contribution here today to everyone who came here today to help us learn more about what we could and should be doing. I yield back the balance of my, my time. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, 
Uh, gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes for his questions. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Perlmutter, for your leadership in holding this very, very- Mr. Barr, can I stop you? Apparently, I was supposed to go to Mr. Posey. Was he here? Mr. Oh. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Posey, you're recognized. I'm sorry to screw up the order. Mr. Po well, now he's going to leave us. Okay, Mr. you're Chairman, recognized I for five minutes. I'll take away what I said about Mr. Barr. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Chairman Perlmutter. I appreciate it. Um, Professor Hughes, how should we measure the delivery of financial services to U.S. consumers? And what does your research suggest about how well the U.S. financial system meets those metrics? That's a very interesting question, Congressman. So um, in preparing for this testimony, I was thinking about the um, importance of serving rural and small communities because one of the strengths of our economy is specifically due to the fact that we had banking services available across the country um, pretty early in our uh, nationwide economy with the railroads and telegraph and things of that sort. So the lifelines of the small communities include community banks and community national banks where people get loans and small business lending is vital because we had an economy when I was a child that where large corporations dominated who the number of people who worked, but that's not true anymore. Startups and small businesses battered badly through the pandemic, but helped by banks and others. Um, small business lending is vital to the continued prosperity in our communities, to the ability of people to recognize the American dream by by building new businesses. And Main Street cash services are also very important. We've heard from time to time that there have been problems with banks banking Main Street businesses that were cash intensive. So I'd like very much to see the services that are needed by consumers and small businesses to be an important point of focus for the committee as a whole and for this subcommittee in particular. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on how the course of financial system regulation has impacted the incentives for bank mergers over the last several years? Well, we see um, ebbs and flows in the, um, in the interest of bank regulators in approving mergers and acquisitions. But mostly we've been seeing um, encouragement or not dissuasion from that. And I think that there is a, um, a concern that we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions at the moment. There is a lot of money, capital around to assist with this, and that's fair. But I think we need to continue to have a well-balanced dual system, which includes the states as, as charters of banks and ILCs and licenses for other kinds of providers of these services. Right. Have, have recent regulatory changes in bank capital requirements, such as risk-weighted capital, uh, provided incentives for banks to merge? I don't think there's there can be much question, although I do not have data to prove it. I think the, the capital requirements, um, especially as applied to small banks, may, may be a problem, but that is something for which I, I know there's some data, but I don't have the data. I suspect that um, the American Bankers Association would have some of that data and that other organizations would as well. I just don't. Okay. Uh, can you explain how scale economies and banking and other financial services have played a role in driving the bank mergers? Well, certainly as Mr. Reuter was testifying, the cost of, of um, technology, the cost in certain ways of compliance has continued to grow and that we have added responsibilities without necessarily looking at older requirements to see if they're still needed or if they're in some ways duplicative. So scalability is a factor, a big factor, I believe. It's not just, 
how many deposits you have to de or how much unimpaired capital and surplus you have to use for the bank measure of making a loan if you're using section 84 of the national bank act for example but it is a big factor driving consolidation and it has been a big factor all the way back to the supreme court's first case philadelphia national bank which continues to be the standard for mergers even when the market has changed very dramatically. Thank you. I see my time is about to expire. And I Chairman, could I make a... Mr. Uh, Reuter, did you have something you wanted to add? I just wanted to comment that the American Bankers Association has been very supportive of tailoring, which would make a huge difference in what we're talking about here. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman, thank you, Mr. Posey. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from New York, the chairman of uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Meeks, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this very timely hearing. Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Ruder first. You know, in the past several years, uh, we've uh, seen that it's becoming more difficult uh, for new banks to be created to help serve their communities. Uh, and this is especially true uh, in communities where bank consolidations have led to access challenges for people of color, but in particularly in districts like mine, they're becoming banking deserts. Uh, so what do you believe is the biggest challenge to de novo bank charters? And what do you think that we can do uh, in Congress uh, to assist and ensure that de novo banks are successful? Thank you for that question, Congressman Meeks. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, uh, there's two things I think making a big difference, regulatory burden and the investment required in technology. Uh, U.S. policymakers could make a big difference on the regulatory burden by tailoring. Uh, you know, we as a bank are very different when compared to J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America, yet some of the compliance infrastructures and things we have to put in place are very much the same. From a technology standpoint, there are great opportunities for banks to partner with fintechs, and we're doing that every day. But where it becomes an issue is when we're competing with those same organizations or like organizations, and they're not regulated at the same level. Um, that drives up our cost of business because we're competing with the branch infrastructure uh, that they do not have. I agree with you wholeheartedly that branches are very important in the community, and it's something that we take very seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Let me ask Mick, Miss Mix Gonzalez Brito. Uh, your organization uh, is very engaged in bank merger process, in the process of bank mergers, particularly analyzing bank mergers and community benefits. Uh, how banks comply with the Community Reinvestment Act is critical to that analysis. As you know, the banking regulators are rethinking the CRA's regulatory framework. So my question to you is, is in what ways can CRA play a more meaningful role in the bank merger process? And are there specific policies this committee should advocate for regarding CRA's role in bank mergers? Thank you for that question. Um, in terms of CRA, uh, we agree with Chairwoman uh, Waters that hearings are extremely important for bank mergers. And we would ask that the CRA uh, require hearings and require community benefits agreements in order to encourage banks to actually meet with the community and engage around community need. Uh, the other piece that I think is incredibly important is that CRA be race conscious. Um, it is something that would really uh, ensure that we're meeting the needs of Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, and so uh, we really need to ensure that as CRA moves forward, uh, these things are included. And I would just add that the, the, the Bank Merger Act is also important to ensure review of mergers and acquisitions are not harming communities. And thank you for that. Now, and I've heard, and I go to Ms. Hughes real quick, uh, because, you know, there's this a lot of uh, issues and questions in regards to uh, fintechs and fintech companies. And, uh, you know, I heard some talk about, uh, for example, that uh, fintech companies operate the way they would do and they helped uh, with the PPP loans of, uh, efficiently and effectively. I agree with Chairwoman Waters and her statement. We had to do certain things on our side uh, also. 
Uh, so it's, it's uh, something that's important. Uh, but we have this debate going on oftentimes in regards to fintechs. You know, I know I was talking to some members of my staff who actually say that uh, they don't know the last time that they visited a physical bank. I talked to my daughters who were young and they uh, are now, you know, doing things on loan uh, and basically utilizing uh, um, fintechs. Um, nevertheless, uh, as indicated, fintechs are largely dependent on banks to meet uh, their commitments uh, to their investors and their customers also. Uh, and just this past August, the FDIC and the OCC issued guidance for how banks and fintechs could partner and the concerns that existed, some of which were mentioned uh, by, uh, by, by the witnesses here today and other members. So Ms. Hughes, uh, what is your reaction to that recently issued guidance and are there legal or regulatory gaps with the bank fintech, part, fintech partnership model that Congress should still consider uh, looking at and possibly closing? Thank you so much, um, Congressman Meeks, for that question, or Chairman Meeks, for different purposes, for that question. Um, the, the August 2021 guidance that was issued for community banks to use fintech partners, I think, is going to be very valuable. I think Congress should pay careful attention to how, what it does and whether it begins to resolve the kinds of questions that community banks have had in this arena so that they can take advantage, as I mentioned in my prepared statement, of some of the facilities and bring them in as vendors. Um, I, I'm going to use Professor, vendor, not partner. Yes. I'm going to have to cut you off. The gentleman's time uh, has expired. And now I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, and I mean it this time. Uh, well, I, I thank Chairman per Perlmutter for that, and, and I thank him also, again, for his leadership for holding this very, very important hearing that underscores uh, the, the problem that we're seeing in bank deserts uh, with uh, bank consolidation uh, and with the, the, the lack of new bank formation that is um, uh, impairing our local economies. I, I applaud my good friend Greg Meeks for uh, identifying this problem in his area in a more urban congressional district. I have a similar problem with rural banking deserts in Kentucky. We've talked about the, the solution. I also want to uh, applaud my friend Mr. Auchincloss uh, for identifying this um, uh, in, a, in a more suburban uh, district. And the data on the dearth of de novo bank formation in recent years, combined with the trends in bank consolidation and closure, are troubling to all of us because too many communities are left without access to, to traditional financial services. Uh, this committee advanced Mr. Auchincloss's bill that calls for a study. Um, and I, I uh, appreciate the American Bankers Association and, and uh, Mr. Uh, Reuter for um, pointing out that the ABA endorsed uh, Mr. Auchincloss's bill uh, that would uh, uh, commission uh, additional studies. But, but I would respectfully, Mr. Reuter, um, argue that another study is insufficient. I mean, you've, you've identified yourself in your testimony that we know what the solution is. The solution is tailoring, regulatory tailoring. And uh, my bill, which is also, Mr. Reuter, endorsed by the American Bankers Association, but was not mentioned in your uh, testimony, uh, is the actual solution. It's the solution that you just prescribed. H.R. 2561, the Promoting Access to Capital and Underbanked Community Acts Act would provide targeted temporary phase-in of regulatory capital requirements to fuel new bank formation and bring banking services to underserved area, areas. This is precisely the bill that, Mr. Reuter, your organization has endorsed. Uh, it goes beyond what uh, Mr. Auchincloss has done. I applaud Mr. Auchincloss for his leadership. I applaud the ABA for endorsing his bill. But his, his bill, uh, respectfully, is just another study. Uh, my legislation is the solution. It's the solution to the lack of new bank formation in Mr. Auchincloss's district. It is the solution to the lack of new bank formation in my rural district. And it is the solution to the lack of new bank formation in Mr. Meeks's district, an urban district. So uh, my question uh, uh, to you is, you know, why, why should we have another study? Why shouldn't we just go ahead and pass the ABA, ICBA endorsed 
legislation that actually implements the regulatory tailoring that is required, Mr. Reuter? Well, first of all, Congressman Barr, thank you for your sponsorship of that bill, and I agree with you. I think another study uh, just uh, lets more time go by and more bank consolidation occur. Um, so I agree 100 percent. Another thing I'd like to point out in the cost of a de novo is uh, one of the things you have to raise to start a bank is capital. And what you're seeing is some individuals and some groups form a fintech versus a bank because due to the regulatory arbitrage, the market's valuing them higher. And anybody that's making an investment to run a bank or run any company needs to have a return. So Again, why a level playing field is very important, but thank you for your sponsorship of the bill, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, thank, thank you very much. And, and Professor Hughes, let me talk about why this is so important. A recent FDIC study showed that large banks are much more likely than small community banks to have minimum requirements for small business loan amounts and less likely to offer tailored small business loan products. Often, small businesses rely on the relationship banking and the community ties of small banks, especially those banks that are, you know, de novo charters and, and smaller. Um, PPP was an illustra illustrative example of the value of, of small community banks for the smallest businesses. Professor Hughes, what impact does the trend in consolidation and the closure of community banks have on small businesses, particularly in, in rural underserved areas? And, and what does it mean for, um, for startups? entrepreneurs, uh, small entrepreneurs and startups? Thank you, Congressman Barr, for that question. It's very important to have lending facilities in communities of the types that we have just been discussing, inner in city deserts, small community and suburban areas and rural communities. And we need to have robust opportunities for lending maintained in those communities so that all of the capital in the country doesn't flow to larger cities as we have been seeing in some cases over the last 50 years. So we need to maintain the ability and we need to be certain that there are realistically tailored, I'm going to use that word because I think it's the best word we've heard today for this, tailored ability for small banks to originate loans, smaller loans for startups perhaps, then they might give other kinds of businesses because we need startups, we need small businesses, they are the growth opportunity and we need to be certain that we have the best means of addressing the way in which startups and small businesses contribute to our economy employ lots of people, provide benefits, but also keep our small communities Pro Professor, alive. Professor, I'm sorry, I've got to cut you off again. And uh, everybody keeps asking you their question right at the end of their five minutes. So I apologize uh, for cutting you off. I'd like to yeah, yield now back. five minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, the chair of the Agriculture Committee, Mr. Scott. Thank you, uh, Chairman Perlmutter. Um, Ladies and gentlemen uh, on the panel, I'm concerned about this, uh, how technology and artificial intelligence is reshaping our banking system. And uh, nowhere is my concern as great as it uh, is uh, impacting African Americans. Let me share with you why I say that. According to the Census Bureau, the rate of home ownership for African American families sits at 44% versus for white people, 74%. This huge and dramatic 30-point gap is a major contributor to racial economic disparities, and it is especially impactful in home ownership, which uh, is where we develop and nurture our wealth consideration. So I'm concerned that this new technology, the use of artificial intelligence, 
and this inherent bias seems to be contributing factors in rejecting black home loan approvals. And not only uh, do blacks uh, uh, home applicants receive higher loan rejections, they also suffer from race premiums on interest rates paying as much as 8% uh, more on mortgage interest. So, Miss Hughes, uh, you and Miss Henry Nicky, respond to me and tell me, in your opinion, am I right here? Cannot you all see this disparity? And how detrimental is this secret bias? hidden in some fintech lending systems for uh, African Americans and other minority consumers that may be seeking a mortgage. How impactful is this? Congressman, would you like me to Ms. go Hughes. first or Miss Henry Nicky to go first? Oh, I'd love for either one. Go ahead, Miss Hughes, and then okay. Miss. Uh, Henry, uh, I want to get both of your points in this, so, and I got two minutes. Fair lending laws in the United States apply to banks, and they should be um, not causing either un unwarranted rejections of mortgage applications or race premiums in applications. I have not had an opportunity to study the degree to which fintechs and artificial intelligence may be contributing to a shift, but it's conceivable that that um, Ms. Henry Nicky has a, or, or Dr. Henry Nicky has a, a, a more data on that subject. So while I believe that we need to be sure that people are evaluated fairly, then I don't have the data to give you a better response. I would, I would ask. Missy. Yes. Ms. Henry, Nikki, would you comment, please? Thank you. Uh, you raise a crucial, important question that nobody else has sort of addressed today, and that is, what is happening to the state of the banking system when it comes to broadening access to credit for African American and Hispanic communities? And at the heart of that, at the heart of your question, stands fintech. Right. So, Mr. Roy's point: leveling the playing field means that we need to figure out ways to ensure that our consumer protection framework applies equally to banks, non-banks, and fintech lenders. Uh, there's a good amount of research sort of coming up showing that fintechs have done an incredible job, I think a commendable job in expanding access to credit. Um, but they are capable, just as uh, their conventional lender counterparts, of reproducing, particularly pricing disparities. Uh, at the heart of this is the kinds of data sources that they draw on to inform their machine learning algorithmic models. We've talked ad nauseum about machine learning bias here. And all of these are in play around suppressing that 44% number and driving it even lower. We need the CFPB to have a leg up when it comes to fairly protecting consumers across all of the domains, particularly when it comes to fintechs, and they, they're shaping the market, but they're escaping their, their, their responsibility and the oversight around consumer protection. And that's what explains and it's at the heart of how these disparities will continue to grow and not improve uh, in, in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Loudermilk from uh, Georgia is recognized for five minutes for his question. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been concerned about the future of our marketplace uh, lending ever since the majority made the misguided decision to restrict access to credit for low and moderate income consumers by replacing the OCC's true lender rule. Both the lender, both the true lender and the valid when made principle are essential to having a robust financial lending nationwide marketplace. Ms. Hughes, how has the Bank FinTech partnerships been affected by this uh, returning to the legal uncertainty uh, that we were in uh, a few years ago. So, the um, true lender rule, as I said in my statement, had big support and lots of criticism. But the um, 
the the concept uh, that was underlying it that was very important to me was the concept of assigning specific responsibility for complying with federal and state law. So the true lender rule had that benefit. Um, it did have some some pieces that uh, particularly irritated the states and uh, from their traditional uh, interest in consumer protection. And I think it is unclear right now how much the repeal will affect the that marketplace. But I think it is a, it is worth paying attention to on a longer term. However, I would say that one of the reasons that is makes this complicated is the true lender rule cannot come back unless Congress specifically authorizes the bank regulators to engage in regulation in that respect. So my hunch is that the um, the uncertainty that was expressed will continue to a degree. And one of the questions that is present in this is should the partners of banks, as opposed to the banks themselves, entitled to exportation of rates that we have long, well, we've had since the Civil War um, in the National Bank Act? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. One of the things that any business needs is, is some level of stability and uncertainty creates problems in the market, which basically hurts the consumer. Uh, other concerns I have is, is one is, I've always thought that uh, George Orwell's 1984 was a futuristic novel. But based on some of the proposals that we've been seeing coming out of the other side, it appears that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle actually see it instead of a novel, but as a best practices guide for big government. Uh, we've just heard about uh, the proposal to monitor every, in, in every American's bank accounts. That's truly Orwellian in my opinion. Uh, some of the other proposals we've heard recently is uh, having the Federal Reserve or the U.S. Postal Service become a bank. This would have the government essentially replace the private sector banking system and give the government in itself direct access to everyone's transactions. Apparently, this is what the administration wants because uh, the president's nominee for the uh, comptroller of the currency said just a few months ago, we should end banking as we know it, which inevitably would be taking away the private sector from it. Mr. Hughes, what would the consequences be for consumers and the economy under these types of proposals? Congressman? Ms. Hughes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, the, the uh, frankly, I'm not uh, certain that the um, idea of postal banking is a good one. When we have so many options currently in some communities and we need to build through de novo applications and other and and resistance to closing of branches i don't see a need for postal banking to be allowed even though um it was a factor and it was still in present in in some way when i was a small child so i think there's that the that to me i would prefer to have the banking system in many respects be made more robust in these communities that that some of your colleagues across the aisle have been discussing second i think that the um the banks already monitor the influx and outgo of every account so my understanding of the proposal is that it would require additional reporting not additional record keeping because the banks have to keep records of every transaction down to about a hundred dollars if not more and they have been doing that for many years, but reporting at that level is a very different matter and one that I understand at some level the interest in and at other levels, I think that that would be a crushing blow of compliance responsibility and cost for the banks that are serving rural, <coughs> suburban and small towns and small businesses especially for small businesses that would be very burdensome and it would bother me greatly uh, thank you madam chair i yield back the gentleman the yields back. mr chairman uh, could i could i make one comment sure mr Ryder, go ahead uh i would like to comment on the federal reserve holding direct consumer accounts and put a little uh, exclamation point on the impact it would have for us as a bank 
60% of our deposits are consumer retail deposits, and that's what we put into work into our community. And so it's a, it's a bit mind boggling for me to think that someone in Washington, D.C. would know better how to deploy those deposits in our community than the 3,000 employees I have that live here, work here, go to school, send their kids to school. So I find that proposal very troubling. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Business, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Promoter. Thank you so much uh, for this hearing. Mix Gonzalez Brito, in 2018, California became the first state in the country to enact TILA-like requirements for business purpose loans. Senator Menendez and I are currently preparing to reintroduce small business TILA legislation here at the federal level. First, can you please explain how the enactment of this legislation in California has brought so much needed guardrails for small business loans, particularly those offered by non-bank lenders without impacting the availability of credit? Thank you, Congressman. Well, man, this is a really important question. Um, we are really proud of our State Truth and Lending Act in California. Uh, we help to make that a reality and along with the Responsible, Responsible Business Lending Coalition. Um, so what this provides, what the law provides is as banks are, as small businesses have a hard time accessing credit with uh, traditional banks, uh, they often are stuck with, um, you know, looking at uh, often these very expensive, high cost lenders. And so it's, in, it's imperative um, that this law um, uh, allow small businesses, that it does allow small businesses to know um, the details of the loan they're getting into so that they can make better decisions. I would say that um, TILA in California, uh, through rent-to-bank charters and industrial loan charters, banks are uh, evading or trying to evade laws, so we have to be really careful about that. Where secured a charter outside of California in order to not have to uh, uh, be uh, subject to these state laws. And can you also talk about why legislation at the federal level is so necessary? Well, and because of um, the uh, evasion by charters at the local level, uh, it's really important to have federal legislation in order to be able to stop that kind of evasion of consumer protection laws at the local level, and we, we support that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jackson, um, Mr. Reader, what steps is the banking industry taking to increase the number of branches in LMI and communities of color, and how can Congress help promote the number of branches, uh, branches in this community? Ms. Jackson, let me start with you. Okay. So um, thank you for, for your question. And, and basically, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about it, but what I will say is that I think that um, the banking industry is taking steps to make banking e easy and accessible for all, regardless of whether there are branch locations down the street. We just want to use online banking and mobile banking and bank from your, your business and office settings and convenience and accessibility are all important. Mr. Reader. A Congresswoman, I would uh, answer with a couple things. I do agree with Ms. Jackson. We're making lots of technological tools available, but I will also tell you that uh, in addition to branches, our officers and employees are on the ground in the community. One of the fundamental changes in banking is people don't walk into a branch as often for a loan anymore. Even a mortgage, we're meeting uh, at their home, whatever the case may be. At the same time, I would also tell you there's a very rigorous process with CRA when we're going to open or close a branch to look at the impact to an LMI community. So there is existing regulation in that area, but part of the nature of this hearing is how banking is changing. And as Ms. Jackson pointed out, it's technology, but that's also put us on the ground more. So I would argue feet on the ground walking a neighborhood is really powerful as well. Can I just add one uh, comment to the record there on this question? We have sure. an opportunity to revisit the um, uh, Community Reinvestment Act. And, and there are serious questions around the, the utility, the, 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 the value that retail branches bring to communities of color and low-income communities in particular. 
the goal should be in this sort of discussion to how to encourage the growth, but not, not just current encourage growth of banking, how to maintain the infrastructure that we already have. There is no one to one replacement of close a branch and then switch a consumer online to a mobile application. We know that relationship building relationship business is so incredible for small businesses, particularly those that need to walk in with their bank statements and explain why perhaps the last two weeks uh, inventory was low that impacted cash flow. So as the uh, acting uh, uh, controller has signaled that he's ready to revisit this modernizing CRA Act, let's tailor the presence of the banking infrastructure to the communities that need it most. And we saw it during COVID and all those minority and underserved community that they didn't, didn't have uh, branches of uh, banks uh, in their communities or pre-existing relationships, how difficult it was for them to access the, needed that they, uh, the, the help that they needed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. A gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Democrats try to figure out how to pay for their massive expansion of government programs through the reconciliation process, they have come up with a proposal that would force banks and credit unions to report all inflows and outflows of customers' bank accounts over $600 to the IRS. When I first saw it, I thought it was a joke. Now, there's many issues with this type of proposal. I want to just name a few of them. From a privacy perspective, the IRS does not have a good track record of using Americans' tax data responsibly. We saw during the Obama administration that conservative nonprofits were being targeted for their beliefs, and this proposal has the potential to take this kind of overreach even further. From a data security perspective, the IRS is the target over a billion cyber attacks a year. We don't have the clarity on how all this additional data on Americans' financial transactions will be kept secure from the bad actors. Now, from an administrative perspective, it would be extremely costly for financial institutions to implement, almost impossible. We would be better off if banks could do what they're supposed to do and be focused on hiring more loan officers to get more money to Main Street businesses, not dealing with increased compliance costs, hiring more compliance officers and creating less opportunities for small business to borrow money. And finally, the Democrats are claiming that this will generate over $200 billion in new tax revenue. Well, that's a bogus number. It's an absurd estimate based on half thought of and half baked assumptions with no uh, groundings in reality. But why should reality get in the way of a good story, right? So as you can tell, I've got a lot of issues with this proposal, but Mr. Reuter, I wanted to get your thoughts on it as well, since you have been a banker for over 34 years. So can you discuss some of the negative consequences that this new reporting proposal would place on your bank, and you've done it a little bit today, and thousands of other financial institutions all across the country if it were to become law? Well, thank you for that question, Congressman Williams, and you did a great job of summarizing my concerns, privacy being the first, I think a lot of individuals will rethink whether they have a bank account if they think everything we have is being reported to the IRS. Security, uh, no matter how well the IRS does their job, they're a much bigger target. And if we increase the pot of gold, if you will, sitting there with everybody's transactional information, I only think the attacks will increase. And then administratively, the cost would be significant. I know that uh, Professor Hughes mentioned we already track data, but it would be still costly to report it. We don't track it in the manner that's being contemplated here. We might look for anomalous activity or fraud, but we aren't tracking it in a way that uh, meets the format of what the IRS is looking for. And, you know, putting this burden on the banking industry, the purpose of this hearing, uh, one of the things I'm hearing is branch closing, consolidation, all those concerns. This is yet another regulatory burden that would only further consolidation in the industry, which I don't think anybody on this a witness stand or in this hearing wants to see more of. Well, thank you. We you did a great job with PPP and everybody talked about it. Now we're now we're going after you. Doesn't make sense. We've heard in this hearing that innovation will help drive financial inclusion. I couldn't agree more and think we need to empower the private sector. New concept, empower the private sector to come up with new solutions to give more people access to financial services. Unfortunately, Democrats want to make this harder by increasing taxes on businesses and decreasing their incentive 
bring these new innovations to the marketplace. So Mr. Reuter, with the time we have left, I wanted to give you the opportunity to discuss the effects of increasing taxes in a time that is just unbelievable. We think of it putting more burden on the taxpayers and small business will have on innovation within the banking industry. Well, anytime you increase taxes, you take money out of the economy that's put to work. Uh, you reduce capital, you reduce retained earnings and funds available for investment. So I, I am opposed to increased taxes uh, because I think it will act against the stimulus and the momentum we have in the economy right now. So I just think it's a bad idea. Well, you're right, and the economy still is pretty good because many of the 2016 tax cuts are still in force. But to increase taxes is total burden. It's a total downer for small business. Small business is already playing defense because they don't know what the heck's down the road. And it, it gets into less jobs, less opportunity, and basically less taxpayers. So we need to cut taxes. Uh, with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, uh, Mr. Chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'll start with a few observations, and I've actually got a question or two hidden in here somewhere. Uh, I want to commend the chairman of this committee um, for the passage of the SAFE Act as a provision of the NDAA. Uh, so many of us have co-sponsored that legislation. And the idea that those who engage in legal business have to carry around huge quantities of cash is absurd. I also want to point out that this is a pretty powerful subcommittee in that uh, I, be I believe four of, well, four of the people who have already asked questions are chairs of their own full committees of the House of Representatives. Um, one of the bills we're considering here today is uh, uh, it's listed for consideration as the NCUA oversight third party vendor. Concerns about this. We're going to come forward with it. It ought to be subject of a, of a separate hearing. Uh, I think that uh, we'd want to know uh, whether the uh, existing authority to force credit unions to sever relationships with problematic vendors is, is sufficient. Um, the uh, questioner just before talked about um, our efforts to enforce tax laws. And uh, it's clear. Uh, what some in the other party, and maybe even a few in my party, would like to see, and that is that the income tax becomes a tax only on wages. Wage earner gets a W-2 uh, form to collect that tax through withholding. But an awful lot of the income in this country is wage through profits and capital gain. And so the goal is to make sure that increasingly sophisticated mechanisms are available uh, to um, hide that from the IRS. And to scuttle any effort from the IRS to keep up with those uh, with those methods, um, we uh, uh, then we see an effort to be a cryptocurrency alternative. Crypto means hidden this money. Who wants to hide their money? Well, now the occasional terrorist taxes. We're on our way to a situation where the income tax nominally affects the wealthy, but actually affects. Um, I'm concerned uh, with the uh, industrial loan uh, company uh, loophole to the basic rule in our economy, which is that we keep commerce separate uh, from financial services. Um, we see that Walmart and Amazon are still looking uh, toward uh, creating a financial institution. Um, uh, I uh, commend uh, uh, Chuy Garcia for uh, his uh, discussion draft. Uh, he's done a good job of grandfathering certain ILCs because they've been fine. But uh, I, uh, we see that uh, Rakuten, the, uh, in effect, the Amazon of Japan, is looking to create an ILC here in the United States. Uh, Ms. Uh, Henry Nicky, what are the risks do you think associated with having uh, Walmart or its Japanese uh, alternative uh, given uh, an ILC, given an FDIC insurance? Uh, Congressman Sherman, thank you for your question. Uh, what I think I heard you ask is what are the risks of having these non-traditional players, large systemic players, uh, now sort of show up and shape the 
financial services market. And I think the risk to consumers uh, is great. Um, these institutions do not come to this market with an organic culture of uh, consumer protection, uh, an organic culture of building and creating wealth for, consumer, for uh, communities of color. And so I try to think about systemic uh, solutions and harken back to the, the uh, CFPB's larger participant rule. Um, you know, that, that, that availability, that's that, that jurisdiction that's available to the CFPB and hoping that they, uh, under you know, new leadership, will be more aggressive, assertive in revisiting the kinds of institutions that fall under a larger participant rulemaking, be more flexible. Uh, when you've got Amazon, to um, Ms. Brito's uh, uh, testimony, playing in the financial services space, deciding you know, who gets credit, who ha gets to sell, and really sort of shaping the lives of startups, entrepreneurs, and small businesses, particularly for minority women, minority owned and women owned businesses, mm -hmm. we want those activities to be examined to be supervised. We want there to, be, there to be guidance around these fringe intermediaries that seem like they're on, on, on the, the edge of the market, but they're so large. You know, they're shaping the market and changing all of the trends, even as we speak here. So I really I, want us to re-examine see if he does his work there. We've heard from many members whose constituents are perched in the banking desert. Uh, but when you're in the banking desert, you when you're in a desert, you can become delirious. Uh, you can run toward a mirage. You can drink brackish water. And uh, we've got to make sure that the uh, that uh, those answers are not mirages. I that. Thank you. And the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butt, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank the chairman and thank the panel as well. You know, we've seen a lot of peer-to-peer uh, -peer payment services come on the scene the last several years, um, including um, uh, things that where they don't have to hold traditional bank accounts, they can make payments, transfer money. Um, a lot of great promise here uh, to help underserved communities. So this question is for you, Mrs. Hughes. How can FinTech and banks work together? How can they collaborate to expand access to financial services, especially for these underserved communities? This is a very interesting question, Congressman Budd. Uh, I think that we have to be very careful to protect community banks and community national banks and small and smaller regional banks for, as Mr. Reuters suggested, by not taking deposits away from them. So I'm concerned every time I see an advertisement that suggests that you can deposit money with somebody who isn't claiming to be a bank. I realize that they may have a bank supporting them, but I think we should be very cautious about that, even though there are opportunities for inclusion in some of those areas that fintechs can provide. But I would prefer to see a perpetuation and even strengthening of the opportunities that local banks with relationships with their uh, depositors are offering. At the same time, I think we will see services that are provided. But among the services, because we don't let securities firms take deposits, insured deposits by the FDIC, I don't believe that we should have fintechs do that either. As much as they offer certain forms of promise, I think we risk undermining capacity of, of regional and community banks of both state and federal charters to provide lending opportunities in their own communities of service. Thank you for that. I still want to look for opportunities for collaboration. Uh, I want to change the uh, question up a little bit. Mrs. Hughes, this is still for you. you know, earlier this year, Democrats led a joint resolution to revoke the OCC's final true lender rule. And we think that really restricted access to affordable credit, hurt small businesses, that hurt consumers, and it created a lot of uncertainty in an industry that ultimately negatively impacts borrowers. So Mrs. Hughes, how has the repeal of the true lender rule affected consumer choice and their access to credit? Congressman, I regret to tell you that I think it's too early to answer that question. I think the 
prospects that there could be some shifts of uh, not having a true lender rule are are present. I think that the um, the remarks that have been made about the um, opportunities that for partnerships, because certainly fintechs can originate loans at much lower cost than banks can, but it is important to recognize that those uh, loan originations may come from with other costs to local communities. And I know that you, among others on the panel of both sides of the aisle, are passionate about keeping local opportunities available in rural areas, in suburban areas, in urban bank deserts. And I think that this is one of the places where we have to be especially cautious. But essentially, I have stopped paying attention to the true lender rule as it was, because until Congress reauthorizes it, it's a dead letter. So I've been focused instead on how we can support um, the, the banks that still exist or that may become available in the three sets of communities that are currently experiencing the negative side of bank consolidation. And I am, I, I just, I stopped paying attention on the, June 30th when the rule was repealed. I also would say, and could provide information to you separately, um, that there are some costs to the lenders that may be attributable that that were not necessarily described by the OCC. So if that needs to be an offline conversation, let's have it. Certainly, thank you. In the remaining seconds, Mr. Reuter, anything you see driving the trend of closures and consolidation among rural community banks? Uh, I think rural community banks, uh, you know, I grew up in a town of 500 people in Wisconsin on a dairy farm. They're very important, and I think they, they're on the ground making loans, doing things. So I think rural banking remains strong. One of the challenges will be them garnering deposits. So, again, to the extent we allow fintechs to be able to draw deposits out of those communities without being regulated the same as banks, I think that's a threat for rural banking as we know it today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. You'll back. Thank you. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the witnesses for appearing. This is a very timely hearing. And Mr. Budd, I want to thank you for uh, your advocacy. If you're still I can there. recognize you. I'm on record. Uh, because I, too, am concerned about rural banks, uh, relatives who live in rural communities. But uh, I'm very much concerned about small banks. I've had at least two groups of persons who are trying to acquire a bank, De Novo, and they are having extreme difficulties with the De Novo process. Uh, I'm going to agree with you, Mr. Reuter. The process has got to be reformed. It's, it's just, uh, it, it's very time consuming. Money is on the line. The paperwork is enormous. And it just seems to take too long. I'm not sure how we reform it, but I, there's something that's got to be done to let us get more banks because looking at the intelligence that's been shared with me by staff, and in 2014 and 2016, there were no de novo charters issued. Zero. That, 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 that is quite disturbing just to see that number. Zero for two years. Uh, these uh, fintechs, they don't have to comply with CRA. They don't have to have uh, physical facilities located in communities. And uh, they don't pay FDIC fees. So we're making it pretty easy for, for them to create these deserts because they're not regulated to the same extent as banks are. Uh, I'm, I'm very much concerned. Uh, Ms., uh, let me ask you, Ms. Hughes. Uh, to what extent do you think fintechs are contributing to the, the banking deserts? Oh, Congressman Green, this is a really interesting question. And I don't know that we have data. But what we do have is, as many witnesses have suggested this morning, is a significant unlevel playing field. And to the extent that we want to have banks, and banks perform many valuable functions in our economy, we need to be sure that they 
have, I don't want to say that they are protected from competition because that's not the right dis decision, but they need not to be uh, undermined by people who can disrupt and disintermediate what we have used for all time in this country to um, support local economy and local economic growth. And that's as important today, and it's more important today in certain communities, rural communities, in inner city communities that don't have many banks so they can't get easy loans because they don't have relationships, and even suburban communities. I, I've lived in just about every one of those kinds of communities in my life, all along the northern tier, I'd have to admit, but I have. And my, my, my father was from Wenatchee, Washington, which is a small town. Bloomington, Indiana is only a little bigger. My mother was originally from Donnybrook, North Dakota. So what I think is important is we not turn our backs on those communities. And it is not clear to me that we have sufficient incentives for fintechs to continue to help in those communities. And if we don't have sufficient incentives for them to help in those communities, then we have to be sure that we retain robust, chartered, whether federal or state, chartered banks available to serve those communities who are still responsible for job growth, startups, small businesses. I hate to end the scene, but I, I have to go to Mr. Reuter quickly. Uh, Mr. Reuter, sir, the same question. To, to what extent are fintechs contributing to the bank deserts that we're seeing? I think the lack of a level playing field is absolutely contributing. We've talked about the online small lending capabilities they have uh, where they're not regulated the same. Uh, they're taking deposits out of those communities. When I talk to rural bankers, one of their biggest challenges is source of funding to make loans in the community. So to the extent we let those uh, tech companies extract deposits and not be regulated the same, that's a negative. And to the previous congressman, I think the way you enhance more collaboration is you do make it a level playing field. I'm not against competition. I just want to make sure that we lean into the trust that's already there in the banking system. And I think you as policymakers deserve a lot of credit for that trust and resiliency. So let's not forget the history and let's make sure the new technology abides by the same rules. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have my time the piece up, so I don't know how much time I have left and I, and I want to be respectful of you. So I'm going to simply close with this. Uh, we are at a point now where African-American banks are about to become an endangered species. And we've got to do something. We have to do something to protect them and to assure us an opportunity to have more. And I want to stand with those who want rural banks protected. You've got a friend in Al Green. We've got to get together, Mr. Bud. Thank you, everybody. Go back. Gentleman yields back. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is recognized for five minutes for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling today's hearing. Thank you also to the to the witnesses for appearing as well. Ms. Jackson, if I could with, with you, I wanted to discuss a bill, the Payment Choice Act, which is H.R. 4395. It would require retail businesses to accept cash payments and would not allow retail businesses to charge a higher price to customers paying with, with cash. My, my question to you is, of course, there are rights to, to privacy when people make purchases and sales. I think that's an important part of cash. But could you talk about, you talked in your testimony, your written testimony about cash, about the importance of cash as it relates to financial privacy? Ms. Jackson. I had to unmute myself. Thank you for your question. And and I'm, I'm not too certain on what I, I can't recall what I wrote in my my statement, but I do, I do believe in our bank that I'm working for now that we do uh, honor the privacy. You know, the cashless, cash for retail, I, I, for retail banking, is that's something that I think that should continue to happen. I don't want to see it go away, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your your question correctly. And so, we do um, we we just we just stick by our model. We continue to to do the best we can to reinvest into the community and whatever the community, and we listen to the community. 
We listen to their needs. Yeah, I don't know if you know if there's any data out there, but are Americans in rural communities and more urban communities, are they more likely to use cash than people in other areas? I would probably say, I would probably say yes. And I, and and, right, uh, I don't have the data on that, but I, I would probably say yes, that that would be accurate. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Reuter, if I could with, with you, uh, in your banking system, and you've got banks all over, do you know if there's any data or can you say subjectively that people in rural areas or more um, urban areas are less likely or more likely rather to use cash than those in other areas? I do not know whether there's a difference between rural and urban. I can tell you there's a difference in terms of uh, minority communities and low to moderate income use more cash. Can I just and offer for the record one um, interject here that the 2019 FDI survey looks at different kinds of ways that consumers are out, transacting in the banking system. Um, and what's really helpful is how they unpack the use uh, of, of check cashing, bill payment services by racial and sort of socioeconomic demographics. If you look at those tables, you kind of get a sense that people who have disabilities, those who live in ind indigenous American communities uh, that are that tend to be rural, that tend to be uh, remote and spatially isolated, they overwhelmingly use these services more so than other groups. So that gives you a sense that they probably, uh, these are services you need cash to transact in, are likely to be the kinds of communities that need to continue to have our retail sector accept our legal tender cash and then think of you know digital payments as some sort of supplement to expanding uh you know the way that we interact and engage with these communities but that's a good source of data that helps you proxy which communities still rely heavily on on transacting in cash thank you mr Reuter. if i could there have been several there have been several ahead, questions about, about the about the 600 irs reporting question i think ranking my ranking member luca meyer and, and congressman williams asked you about that and you talked about the, uh, the not only set aside the privacy concerns, just the just the administrative hurdles that that would place on on your bank. And all I know is what I what the news reports are. There's apparently there's some negotiation in raising that that limit from six hundred dollars, maybe up to ten thousand dollars. Even if that were to change, does that affect your opinion on, on what that does to you? administratively administering um, um, these requirements for your banks? No, we would still be opposed because the effort would be the same and all the other issues of privacy and security are in existence. And I'd like to connect it back to the conversation we just had on cash. Uh, I think one of the things I heard is people like the anonymity and privacy of cash. This goes completely counter to that line of thinking. Good. Thank you very much and I yield back my time. Thank you to the witnesses. Gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Mr. or gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, who is the chair of the task force on artificial intelligence, is now recognized for five minutes. And he actually is the person who wanted to talk about the future of banking, whether or not technology was going to uh, cause the elimination of banking, or whether mergers and acquisitions, or um, too much uh, government. Uh, burden but i will yield to the gentleman from illinois uh, thank you mr chair for um stealing about half of my talking points for the beginning of my sorry testimony but uh you know but but you're actually correct you know we we're there is sort of this existential battle going on between fintech at one end and small traditional community banks at the other and the part of the fintech model that relies on regulatory arbitrage has very little support on either side of the aisle here and that, that, you know, leveling the playing field in that sense, I think is, it has to be one of our goals here. But the part of the business model for FinTech that relies on the efficiencies of scale, um, then that I think we have to look much more carefully at. For example, uh, a lot has been said about the value of small community banks uh, in the PPP program, but there were examples of small FinTechs who are able to help tens of thousands of small businesses get loans, you know, often with 15 minutes online. And so I, you know, there are advantages of, of you know, of the digital economy. Uh, so uh, Professor Hughes, you mentioned in a couple of uh, 
questioning is back, um, that, that somehow when a FinTech, which was capable of originating a lower cost loan, uh, that that somehow would hurt the, it would be detrimental to communities they serve. Could you go a little deeper into that? Because it sort of confused me. Of okay. how, would a, how would a community be hurt by having an option of getting a lower cost loan online? I don't know that we're we're thinking necessarily about that, Congressman Foster. What I what I intended was to suggest that the the origination piece of how fintechs work is a model that's very attractive. It may be because they do not have all the regulatory requirements that are on banks. So they can perhaps originate loans faster and for less money. The problem is that if you want banks to be in business, banks, and I'm not opposed to fintechs by any means, I, I, this is a real struggle, but banks have to make money. And one of the ways banks make money is through loans. They don't make money, they make money on fees, but they also make money on loans. The loan balance comes back into the bank and because of reserve, fractional reserve requirements, the loan can be recycled in the community. So a small amount can become $5,000 of new money in the community in a very short period of time. That is not necessarily going to happen if fintechs take over more of the lending, unless they are working in partnership with banks that would otherwise be doing the same. But we want to be sure they're not subject to fractional reserve banking. They're subject to corporate level, if they're corporations, corporate level capital requirements that are very different. So we don't get the synergy from bank from lending that we get from lending under the fractional reserve requirement system that we've been using in this country for many years yeah. and that banks are observing. Right, I understand. Then that's exactly an example of the sort of regulatory arbitrage advantage mm -hmm. that the fintechs may have. Yep. Uh, but now the Wall Street Journal was running a series of articles about uh, the stress of rural banks. Uh, I don't know, probably about a year ago. Um, and they ran a series of very interesting articles and they had examples, for example, of small rural banks that were uh, understanding they didn't want to continue in the small town they lived, moved, establish a secondary branch in, a, in the nearest big city and were holding on to the rural things just to extract deposits. Uh, because, you know, frankly, the, the, the bind they were in is that there are no profitable business investments in, sm in small dying rural towns, just to put it bluntly. And, and so they, they didn't see a future there, and they were actually um, extracting, uh, even though these were traditional community banks, they ended up extracting deposits and then investing them at best in the, the nearest big city. Uh, how do we deal with that trend, or is that just part of the free market decision making of, of banks? Anyone want to grab onto that? It's it's something I've struggled with. I yeah, I've represented very rural areas, and trying to figure out what to what to do with that sort of dynamic has been a struggle I've dealt with. Does it, does anyone have any ideas how to? I, I think yeah. that's there, there's no relationship between labeling a bank, size of a bank, and the risk that the, the bank poses to, to a community, right? So community banks are just as well positioned as the Wells Fargo to extract uh, wealth out of any community. And we need to think about ways to empower them, I think, to work with collaborative partners like CDFIs to reintroduce special credit programs that help to repurpose the deposits that they control and invest it in uh, low cost, um, uh, responsible credit products, particularly for small businesses. So I I'd like to dismiss the notion that community banks, because they're community banks, do better um, and, and lower risk uh, work than other kinds of uh, financial intermediaries. We need to think holistically about the all of the systems, all of the loan products that are present in the community and, and, and ways to encourage that legislatively as well as regulatory. Thank question, you, and Chairman. Yep. Oh, uh, just in terms of rural communities in California, uh, our members are really concerned about the closure of branches and uh, the impacts that it has, for instance, on reinvestment back into those communities. So it's really important that CRA uh, require of banking institutions, um, you know, a CRA investment back into communities, especially those that are underserved, like rural communities. I would add that broadband um, and the digital divide in these communities is, is great because of the lack of infrastructure 
So banking can help with that as well uh, in terms of um, investing in broadband and the infrastructure and those. Okay, and I'm afraid the chairman has his finger on the um, on the yeah. devil here. So yeah. I'm out of time. And yes, the gentleman's time has expired. I gave him. I've given everybody a little extra time. I gave him more since this hearing was his idea. I'd like to now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes for his questions. Chairman Perlmutter and Ranking Member Luke Meyer, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you to our witnesses for providing your expertise uh, and your time today. I think that as we work to shape the banking system of the future, we must look to innovation, but also aim to implement a regulatory framework that allows banks of all sizes, of all sizes to be successful. As a former community bank uh, board member, uh, I have seen and witnessed firsthand how the crush of regulation uh, deters particularly our smaller banks from being able to succeed and thrive and particularly to thrive in rural communities as we've heard many of my colleagues uh, say today. Between 2008 and 2020, over 13,000 bank branches closed in the US. We've heard that data today, representing 14% of all branches. Many communities report that following a bank closure, and I've witnessed this firsthand. They also lose financial and community resources, including financial advisors and civil leadership. Sometimes it's simple as the T-ball teams in your community not being able to find the resources to succeed. These losses leave communities with unanswered questions, instability, and less access to services. And again, uh, in the rural community where my, my own farm is, I have witnessed this firsthand. Mr. Reuter, what factors do you see driving the trend of closures and consolidation among community banks? Well, I think you touched on one in your opening statements, Congressman, and that is the regulatory burden. Um, we really need to look at tailoring so that it's lighter uh, for a bank that is less complicated. You know, what we operate at First Bank, uh, where we don't offer insurance or wealth management, other services, is much simpler. So from a regulatory standpoint, it's, uh, it should have less regulatory burden. Um, also, I think the uh, FinTech, the level playing field, one of the benefits of doing that is you get rid of the negative arbitrage that's there so that capital flows back into the banking industry and partnerships do form between tech companies and banks. And that also then, to me, leverages the trust and resiliency of the industry. So I think those things would make a big difference on what's happening in rural markets. Thank you, and I, I certainly agree, as I've already said, about the regulatory framework. I think it's, it's noteworthy that when we implement huge regulatory expansions uh, that maybe in the eyes of folks sitting on high in Washington seem reasonable, when they make their way down to our local communities, they have a crushing impact on, on both the uh, sustenance of our local small community banks and, also, and, and very much on st new ones starting. Professor Hughes, what, what can we do in Congress to ensure the regulatory environment allows community banks to keep their, door, their doors open? Well, I think we've been talking about it all morning in terms of um, retaining the, the robustness of community banks, possibly by tailoring some of the requirements that they are operating under that, that as Mr. Reuter has suggested, are really designed to protect the, the mostly the deposit insurance fund from excessive risk taking, which crops up every once in a while in every form of business. So it's not unique to one. What I think we have, though, is a real crisis in bank deserts and that while we would like to think that there might be other models like fintechs that would address those, in some of those communities, the, the presence of a community bank that depends on relationships is going to be, be even more important going forward in helping small businesses and consumers get startup money that they can't get from capital markets because they're too small and getting um, loans to acquire business locations and things of the like that are important to building communities. So unless we want to see a lot of desert ghost towns around the United States, we have to do what we can to lighten the load on community banks so that they can continue to be there because we, we do still have very valuable parts of our economy emanating from smaller communities, not tiny towns, but, but they're important.
but we're seeing lots of startups in towns like Bloomington, Indiana, towns close to universities. And we need to be sure that there are adequate banking services on a relationship level to protect the robustness of the economies in those communities on which we all actually depend. Thank you, Professor Hughes. I am pleased, and I might indulge the, the chair uh, for a few extra moments, I am pleased to see that the Payment Choice Act is attached to this hearing as, a, as an original co-sponsor, both uh, or this, this Congress. I hope to see this legislation included in our next markup. Throughout the pandemic, we faced not only a coin shortage, but businesses were, were refusing to accept cash as a form of payment at an alarming rate, leaving many consumers unable to purchase necessities. Cashless policies disproportionately harm seniors, minorities, immigrants, low-income populations, and working-class communities such as exist across the 6th District of Tennessee. Consumers want the freedom to conduct transactions in a way that works best for them. Of the 80% of non-bill payments made in person in 2020, cash was used for 28% of these transactions despite the pandemic-driven shift in shopping behaviors. I believe that all consumers should have the freedom to choose to pay with cash at grocery stores, restaurants, businesses, or anywhere they choose. And I might conclude just by saying that if we see some of the heightened regulation about reporting by financial institutions, I think we'll see more consumers, particularly in places like the district that I represent, closing their bank accounts and going purely to, uh, to cash. And thank you for your indulgence. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. You can all see my parenting style is to kind of allow people to keep going. Um, uh, Mr. Lawson, gentleman from Florida, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Luca Meyer for hosting this meeting. And uh, this is a very, very important meeting that we have today. And I want to thank all of the uh, panelists uh, for being here. And uh, and there's been a considerable amount of discussion about uh, banking deserts, you know, almost like food deserts. And and I know that between uh, 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 the, between 2008 and 2016, there have been about 25 percent of the banks and, and so forth have closed in rural areas, uh, which affect ma majority and minority uh, uh, during the uh, census tract. My question would be to everyone, uh, because I don't see whether there was any clear and distinct answers uh, uh, this morning. Maybe they're not in right now. And since we are seeing this increase in the amount of bank deserts, what are the long-term consequences uh, majority and minority communities regarding the economic opportunity and access uh, to credit? Uh, what do this current trend in banking means to low-income communities as we enter the economic recovery period uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and this is open to the whole panel uh, because uh, I guess it's something that we have to deal with, but I know there's been more and more. And, and then there's some criticism about all these options that uh, uh, low-income individuals have to go to uh, different areas uh, to get access to capital, pay their loans and everything else. And people say we don't need them, but what is going to happen? Do you see, uh, uh, can you give any idea of what the future is going to be uh, for rural communities? I represent quite a few rural communities myself, I always have. And I see this trend uh, all over the place. And I just wanted to get each one of your perspectives on where we're going from here, because what has happened uh, in the last couple of years. Congressman, if I could. Um... So in terms of the long-term consequences for rural uh, banking closures, I would say we saw that with bank PPP loans. So uh, half of the PPP loans that banks made were uh, with branches within two miles of the borrower. So if we don't have a bank branch, uh, those relationships are not there, and we saw it very clearly during COVID. I would, I would say that also uh, when we talk about regulatory burden for banks, uh, we really need to center the burden of communities of not having banking. We need to remember that these banks are profit driven and we need to be able to think about alternatives to serve communities that have never been served by the market. And that could include postal banking uh, and public banking uh, which and mission driven banking, which takes the profit 
uh, driven motive to close branches out of the picture. Thank you. Anyone else would like to respond? I would like to add to that. Uh, I do agree with the our, the beneficial state bank is a mission driven bank, just as uh, the other panelists were saying. And I, I think just the fact that we always reinvest into our community, um, it's very important. It's very beneficial. And I think that's, um, that will help out some way if other banks can adopt our model that we're doing. I would just add to the uh, these comments, uh, banking deserts are a consequence of decisions. Banks saying that these markets are no longer valuable to me. And to fill that gap, just like fintechs have done since you know the, the, the great financial, uh, the subprime crisis, we need gap fillers to now come in and see the opportunities in this market. And to do that, we need to really lean in on encouraging de novo bank charters. Black owned banks see the value in black communities. Minority depository institutions have always seen the value in our communities. We need to encourage their growth encourage them to hold ground as opposed to just sitting by and as passive bystanders and letting them just whittle away. We're 50% fewer in, in, in MDIs than we were in 2007. So how do we replace the gap? That's why encouraging new physical branches and banks to grow in these communities and whatever kinds of subsidies we can corral, because we can corral them to facilitate and subsidize their growth, that should be our mission. And Congressman Lossman, I, I share your concern. Um, I think one of the, it is a challenging issue because one of the drivers for branch closers, and I'd like to point out branch closing, we talked about it earlier, we have 50% of the banks we had at one time. And if you look, it's universal across all neighborhoods that there's a reduction in branches. And it's really because of how people are using their bank. Half of our deposits are now made with someone taking a picture of their check. And so in order for us to adapt and make the technology investments, we have to look at how customers are choosing to do business. But I will tell you that um, we are mission driven as a community bank because we only grow if we're serving the community that we're part of. And so I share the sentiments of others. I don't support postal banking uh, because it's already a struggling entity for the same reasons that we're talking today. Technology has changed its business model. So to layer another industry that's being attacked by technology on top of that, I'm not sure that's a good doubling down on the U.S. Postal Service. Mr. Chairman, thanks for letting me go over with, with that other year back. This is a topic that we need to bring up again. If I didn't let you go over, I would have been uh, in real trouble since I let everybody else go over. So um, the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Kasten, who's also the vice chair of the subcommittee on investor protection entrepreneurship and capital markets is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I feel like I'm under a lot of obligation to try to make up all the time you've allowed us to all go over, but I will, uh, I will do my best. Um, the, uh, Mr. Reuter, I want to start with you and, uh, and, and I just want to give you an opportunity. We've talked a lot about the decline in, in small local bank branches and the rise in fintechs. And, uh, and in particular, given that a lot of these fintechs are not regulated under the, the bank holding company act. Are, are there any concerns you have with fintech's ability to serve the underbank so long as they remain not subject to the Bank Holding Company Act that you haven't already covered? Um, and I just want to give you a chance. I know we've got corners of that so far, but anything else you'd like to add on that? Well, thank you, Con Congressman Kasten. I do have concerns. One of the concerns I have is if we talked a little bit about it with the ILC charter, while I think it, it, it is well designed for the purpose originally intended, but you're seeing some of these fintechs and technology companies wanting to creatively get that charter to get access to the payment system. They want that because they want the data. Where do you buy? How do you spend your money? Because they want to use that data in their advertising side of the business. Um, so if you think about it, their motives are very different. As a bank, we've always been in the trust business. I know everything about our customers based on their account information. It's part of why I'm nervous about shipping all of it to the IRS. And so the difference is banks make their money by taking in deposits and making loans. Their core business is not data like many of these tech companies. So our fiduciary responsibility is different and our motive is different and our behavior has been different. So yes, I have a big concern uh, turning over the banking industry to some of these technology companies. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you raised the industrial loan corporations because you, you've sailed directly into my, my second question for Mix Gonzalez-Brito. 
Um, you, you talked with, with uh, Mr. Meeks about some of the CRA issues that come into play with fintechs. Um, can you talk about what the CRA issues or concerns you may have if a fintech is registered as an ILC and uses that to get into the banking system? Are those subject to the same rules as, as other, uh, other players in the banking sector? Uh, that's a great question. No, they're not. And they often uh, use these charters to be able to evade local state protections as, as, that they have in relation to, for instance, interest rate caps. Uh, so I, I find myself agreeing with uh, Mr. Reuter on regulatory, uh, the importance of regulatory um, rules to be equal across uh, the playing field. Um, and so um, we also just want to, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but these these IOCs um, that are taking place in other, uh, that are forming in other parts of the, or any part of the country are not subject to CRA. And we need uh, those uh, FinTechs to be able to, if they're taking deposits, if they're making loans in our communities, which they are, uh, to uh, have a CRA requirement. Um, and then lastly, I would just say fair lending. Algorithms are being used that we don't understand, and sometimes the CEOs don't even understand. Uh, so it's in, in, incredibly important that we have um, regulatory oversight, uh, especially around fair lending and fair housing. Thank you. And with the, with the time I have left, I want to pivot um, a little bit away from fintechs and a little bit because these things are overlaid. But um, a number of the, the crypto-based companies like you know, Paxos and Anchorage and Protego have been asking for and receiving federal trust charters from the OCC and we're creating this sort of blurry area between fintech and crypto. Um, Dr. Henry Nicky, with the remaining time, would welcome your thoughts on what factors we should be taking into account reviewing bank charters from crypto companies, and in particular, with a real focus on the volatility. I mean, we're essentially giving, you know, as I think of it, you know, forex risk on deposits. What is the right way for us to be thinking about? Um, those charters, and in, and in particular with respect to the, the volatility exposure that this might place on, on depositors? Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Congressman Kasten. Whilst I think it's a really important issue, I too am concerned about how these cryptocurrencies are playing inside of our economy without figuring out how to manage the volatility and the vulnerability. I don't follow these issues as a, a scholar. Um, uh, I think perhaps uh, Ms. Hughes might be better positioned to render an opinion on the subject. Okay, um, Ms. Hughes, we seem to always curse you with 30 seconds to answer a 10 minute question, but I'll, I'll give you your best shot. Well, I'll be happy to answer it separately, Congressman, so we can have that conversation. So the rigorous evaluation of anybody who gets a federal trust charter or from the states that are offering charters um, is still present. And I, I do not think that these companies are getting less rigorous reviews when they're getting these permissions. But one of the differences is the scope of the of the operational powers that they have. And when the states have been offering opportunities to these businesses, they have been cabined in certain fields that are not necessarily going to be in direct competition with the kinds of banks, the community banks that we've been talking about so much today. So this is a long, I, I've got the same problem. This is a long answer. We need to have a separate conversation about it. And I think, I do think that we have um, the different management issues, different risk management issues with cryptocurrency because of price volatility than we have with traditional banks. And even with some of the larger fintechs, including some that are now acquiring banks. Okay, well, thank you. And I, and I, notwithstanding my initial promise, it looks like our chairman is going to be managing penalty time at the end of this hearing, but I appreciate you all and I yield back my penalty time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we'll go now to the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, vice chair of this subcommittee. She is recognized for five minutes, then we'll go to Mr. Emmer, and then we'll go to Mr. Garcia to close out. Ms. Presley. Thank you, Chairman Perlmutter, for convening this hearing. 
Um, myself and many of my colleagues for many years have been sounding the alarm about rising bank branch, branch closures in predominantly black and brown communities and the negative impact that this will have on small businesses owned by people of color. That impact was certainly made abundantly clear during the pandemic. Now, Congress created the Paycheck Protection Program to serve as a lifeline to small businesses and their employees. But we now know proximity to banks played a significant role in who actually received funds. Half of bank PPP loans came from banks with branches within two miles of the borrower. Borrowers using a nearby bank received credit sooner, which was a critical advantage as PPP money ran out rapidly. It's no surprise, but egregious nonetheless, that Black-owned businesses received only 2% of PPP loans from the CARES Act. According to the Boston Federal Reserve, one in five Black-owned small businesses had never even heard of the program. Mixed Gonzalez Brito, nearly half of black owned businesses were wiped out in the early months of the pandemic. Can you briefly summarize the long term impact these business closures will have on black and brown communities? Thank you for that question. Um, you're absolutely right. There was a disparate um, uh, impact in terms of the way PPP loans were uh, were uh, administered. And if you think about, you know, the uh, banks in communities of color, Counties that are majority black and brown have about 27 financial institutions per 100 people. For indigenous Native American communities, it's even less. And for white communities that are majority white, we have over 40 branches. So when we close branches in these communities, small businesses really suffer. We know that they need uh, local banks to be able to really um, uh, have those relationships that they trust uh, and to be able to get the kind of um, support that they need, especially in a financial crisis. Thank you. So the closure of branches and consolidation of banks limits opportunities for black owned small businesses. And as a result, our broader community It's a critical that black and brown voices are heard during the bank merger process and that Congress pursues every solution to close these gaps, including public banking and postal banking. Democrats control the House, the Senate and the White House. And together, we have made strides to exact economic justice in our pandemic recovery efforts. But from the priority application period for minority owned restaurants under the Restaurant Revitalization Fund to the USDA loans for black farmers, right wing private interest groups have claimed reverse discrimination in the courts and blocked these overdue investments. Mix Gonzalez Brito, the Freedman Savings Bank was created by Congress in 1865 to offer banking to newly freed black Americans. Can you please briefly summarize what happened to the Freedmen's Bank and the millions of dollars that black Americans deposited into it? Um, the Freedmen Bank is a good example of the way that wealth is extracted from uh, black Americans. And unfortunately, when that bank was created, the mission and uh, what it was created for was absolutely noble. But the major all of the trustees that were running that bank uh, were white, did not know the community. Um, and there was, um, and, and not only did they not know, we're talking about a whole different uh, time frame um, in terms of um, uh, white uh, uh, you know, people in this country and, and enslavement of black Americans. And so um, it's really important that um, as we think about, um, you know, the impact that this has, uh, without banks are actually run by people of color, that we have minority deposit institutions that are run by people of color, um, and that we support them uh, with as much uh, community support and government support that we can Thank in you. order to better serve the community. Thank you very much. And this is important history, which I think many are unaware of. And it just goes to show that there has been precise legislated harm done. Uh, from the Freedmen's Bank to redlining to exclusion from the GI Bill and Social Security Act, black and brown workers have been pushed out of our economic and financial systems for really far too long. So race conscious relief is, is necessary because the hurt and harm was precise and race conscious. So race conscious relief is not discrimination, it is justice. It is a necessary step toward equality and liberation. Thank you, and I yield back. Can I add one more thing, if, if it's okay? Um, you know, there, in terms of race conscious um, uh, uh, initiatives, the special purpose credit program is one that banks really should be um, implementing. And we've been able to successfully uh, work with some banks in California to be able to do that. It really focuses credit products on those communities that have been 
and not only excluded, but as, as we talked about, have been had their wealth extracted from them. And so we encourage banks to uh, look at these kinds of programs and we look forward to working with them to do that. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is recognized for five minutes for his questions. Thank you, Chair Perlmutter. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I also uh, want to thank uh, Mr. Luchtemeyer and Mr. Reuter for bringing up the compliance and privacy concerns of requiring financial institutions to report transactional data to the IRS on all accounts with $600 or more. I, I led a letter with 141 of my colleagues on this issue, and we are watching it very closely. As we convene today to discuss modernizing financial services institutions, I implore my colleagues to think outside the box on how Congress can assist in improving the manner in which consumers access financial products and services, because, well, that's what we're here for today. Congressman Perlmutter, I'd like to recognize you for a moment for your work as the co-lead on uh, our bill, the Credit Union Governance Modernization Act, a bill that thoughtfully re revisits antiquated regulations that prevent credit unions from doing what they need to do, serve their communities. I'm happy to see this bill is noticed in this hearing because it revises the procedure for expelling members from a federal credit union to make it safer for the members and employees. It's imperative that we consider this bipartisan legislation in this committee. Financial institutions have the important responsibility of providing safe, reliable financial services for Americans across the country. But what happens when a credit union member makes threats of violence to other members or the credit union's employees? What happens when a credit union member repeatedly deposits fraudulent checks and jeopardizes the stability of their credit union? What happens when a member damages credit union property and places other members and employees in harm's way? Well, right now, due to the antiquated regulations that exist, it would be hard to remove members who make credit unions unsafe. My bill revises these regulations and crafts a process with an emphasis on due process and respect for members, ownership in the credit union, to remove dangerous members so credit unions can best carry out their obligation, again, to provide safe and reliable financial services for Americans. We really have to move banking into the future. And I guess with that, Ms. Hughes, if, if you don't mind, thank you, uh, by the way, to all the witnesses for being here today and for your time and participation, your expertise. Ms. Hughes, I want to direct this to you. Given the issues I just addressed, do you believe there is cause for a legislative solution like the Credit Union Governance Modernization Act to ensure credit union safety as credit unions provide financial services to their communities? Congressman Emmer, I'm, I have to apologize and tell you that I have not read that bill. <laughs> so I... Hey. I I'm not going to be able to comment about it very specifically, but I would say that the and the credit unions are a little bit different, but the idea that banks um, and credit unions cannot protect themselves from dangerous members is just appalling. The question then is, how do you establish the parameters, if you want to legislate this, that will not have an undue the adverse effect on small businesses that have licenses from the states and the communities that are, are a part of the fabric on Main Street in many communities. How do you, how will we fashion this? And so that's why I need to read the bill and perhaps we can have an on, offline conversation about the bill if you remain interested in my views about it. Well, and it, just so everybody on this panel knows, because I know there's been a lot of techie stuff talked about, and this is kind of uh, more like meat and potato stuff. Uh, the antiquated rules, as Chair Perlmutter will tell you, uh, and I'm going to tell you right now if I can do this in a streamlined fashion, would require a vote of the entire membership to deal with a member who is making violent threats against other members and or credit union employees who's uh, threatening damage or committing damage to uh, credit union property. 
This seems to be an antiquated way and frankly very difficult way to expel a member who is presenting these dangers uh, to credit union employees and their customers. So what this bill does is it streamlines that process while protecting the due process concerns so that they can make a quick decision under the right circumstances and make sure that everybody is safe and the credit union is protected. So I do hope you have a chance to read it. I think you'll be supportive of what we're doing. And again, uh, Chair Perlmutter, I thank you for your uh, your work with us on this, uh, this bill and thank you for the time today. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields Perlmutter. back. I have read your bill and it is meritorious and it should be passed. That's my opinion. Well, then it's done. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, I think our final panelist is uh, Mr. Garcia from Illinois, and he is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Perlmutter, and uh, of course, thank you to the ranking member for convening this uh, important discussion. Uh, this hearing is called the future of banking. Uh, but it's not just about CEOs and Wall Street. The future of banking is about the future of working class neighborhoods like the ones I represent. Uh, my neighbors lost their homes in the Great Recession. Many lost small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. This isn't inevitable. Congress can create and enable more equitable financial system. So today I'm introducing the Bank Merger Review Modernization Act to strengthen oversight of bank mergers so our regulators aren't just a rubber stamp for creating mega banks. And soon I'll introduce the Close the ILC Loophole Act to address the huge threat that the underregulated banks can pose to our markets and our financial systems. I'd like to begin with a question for Mix uh, Gonzalez Brito. Uh, yesterday, the Committee on Better Banks reported that the BB and T and SunTrust merge their new combined bank, Truist, not only fell short of the CEO's promise to Congress to open 15 bank branches in low to moderate income areas, the merger slowed down the pace of opening bank branches in lower income areas and increased the pace of bank branches in higher income areas. Banks can be hard to come by in my neighborhood, and that means my constituents often need to turn to riskier loans. Uh, Mix Gonzalez Brito. It looks like these mergers have reduced access to financial services for the people who need it most. Does this new report square with your own work? Do bank mergers tend to limit access to capital for working class people? And who's hurt uh, by regulate? Who is hurt when regulators serve as rubber stamp for bank mergers? Thank you so much. This is a really important question. It also goes back to Ms. Presley's point, or Congressman Presley, about uh, making sure that community voices and the most uh, impacted community, black and brown communities, are at the center of any discussions around mergers and acquisitions. We are seeing that mergers and acquisitions are leading to not only a closure of bank branches, um, but they're also leading to less reinvestment because where you had two banks priorly, you know, prior to the merger, uh, reinvesting back into communities, you now have only one, and one plus one often doesn't equal two, it equals less than two. Um, so what we really need is uh, to ensure that any merger before it's approved has a public benefit and does not have uh, a public harm. And I really wanna thank you for your work on the Bank Merger Modernization Act, it's exactly what we need. And I would just add, I wanna go back to the credit union discussion, because I, I, I was surprised it took us this long to get there. Um, but credit unions are not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. And so we actually don't know how much they're reinvesting back into communities. And that is critical for low income communities and communities of color. And I would say in relation to, I'm not sure where this conversation went in terms of violence, um, but really what credit unions should be concerned about and what we're concerned about is that they are, uh, their membership actually doesn't represent the communities that they are in. And that's critical for a successful uh, community and economic development and community development. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Henry Nicky, last year, the FDIC approved deposit insurance applications for two new ILCs, the first in many years. Of course, a lot changed since the last ILCs were approved. In 2005, Walmart's uh, ILC applications sparked fears about anti-competitive practices and the potential for financial risk of large 
commercial ILCs. And now in the new world of Amazon, Facebook, and Google, it seems to me that the potential for corporate monopoly and abuse of uh, abuse is greater than ever. Do you think that granting ILC charter to a big tech or large commercial firms could threaten competitive markets, consumer privacy, or financial stability? Uh, thank you for uh, the question and also your work in bringing this incredible uh, piece of legislation to the, 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 the floor. I think you're right in calling out the scariness that involves uh, putting these massive firms that are really good at, uh, you know, sort of killing out competition and monopolizing the entire landscape. I would be tremendously uh, concerned about those kinds of firms getting access to ILC charters. Um, and but I just want to go back, you know, a little to the question around race conscious policies, right? In this this legislation, giving CFPB a vote to stop these kinds of, uh, you know, a scaling of bad uh, bank practices is actually really important to maintaining our hold with, for communities of color on the bank branches that are remaining. And also it's a really help impactful way to generate new bank, bank branches. So part of, you know, the rehabilitation or consumer restitution work that we do, or the Bureau uh, uh, does, is to legislate where that presence should be um, reinstated to help rehabilitate the damage and disinvestment that's done to consumers. So thank you again so much for the incredible work. I really want this piece of legislation to advance and to pass because CFPB can do a fantastic job of holding the institutions accountable and stopping the spread of uh, uh, banking deserts through branch losses. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Welcome. The gentleman yields back without objection. Uh, I think that was our last panel, our last member. So without objection, statements will be entered into the record on behalf of the following members of Congress and organizations, including the Honorable Donald M. Payne, the American Financial Services Association, the Bank Policy Institute, the Credit Union National Association, the Electronic Transactions Association, the Financial Data and Technology Association, the Independent Community Bankers of America, the Independent Armored Car Operators Association, the National Armored Car Association, and the National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions. And I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, for your testimony today. Thank you for allowing me to be lenient uh, with the members and allowing their times to kind of run over. Uh, we appreciate the time that you've extended to us and your expertise uh, and your testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind the members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. Thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony. This hearing is now adjourned.